Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Truth Seeker. This is the Truth Seeker Podcast, man. I'm excited, delighted to be with you guys again today. We've got an awesome show planned for you. Going to be joined by a good friend of mine, Gil Hodges, here in a few minutes, and uh, it's going to be really good. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody supporting the work, everybody who makes this show uh, available. This is a listener-supported, listener-funded show, and it doesn't exist without your help. So I want to say a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for everybody who's partnered with me in this ministry, in this venture, who believes in the work. Thank you guys so much. Uh, give a shout out to some of the latest patrons within the last week or so. Shout out to Amy Watterson. Thank you, Amy. Shout out to uh, Kylie Patricia Ween, Benjamin William Ween, and Callie Bear Patricia Ween. Thank you guys. And this is a, a family that comes together and support, and they all have accounts and uh, with our Patreon. Thank you guys for, for the support way over there in Australia. You guys rock. Uh, and shout out to my friend Taylor for coming on and joining the Patreon support partner with me. Uh, if you'd like to support, head on over to patreon.com backslash truthseeker. There you get access to my entire discography of music. You get access to behind the scenes stuff, our Thursday night School of the Mystics, which is the encounter sessions that we do and tapping into prayer and meditation and breath work and just spending some time in the presence of God. And uh, it's the community aspect to what we're building as well. So you get access to that as well as our Discord servers and all that cool stuff. So check it out, patreon.com backslash truthseeker. Also, my new book is still here. It's still doing well, man. Thank you guys for all the support uh, for this project. And uh, if you guys haven't had a chance to check it out yet, go to truthseeker.com. You can get a copy there, Spirit Realm, Angels, Demons, Spirits, and the Sovereignty of God, how they all fit and play together in God's uh, perfect will for your life. And so what the enemy meant to uh, for your harm, God will in turn use for your good. And I think that this is uh, the main message for this book. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, go to truthseeker.com, get you a copy. We're going to go ahead and jump into today's discussion. My friend, Gil Hodges from Kingdom Talks. What's up, brother? Hey, Derek, how you doing? It's a pleasure doing to be well. on here again. Oh yeah, 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 man. Always, always a pleasure to uh, do ministry with you. Pick your brain, hang out, the next stage of stuff, Kingdom Talk stuff, all that good yeah. stuff. I just want to give a, a shout out on your behalf because uh, you know I'm big on honor. I really believe in honoring people and honoring where you are getting blessed. And I just want to say to your listeners that if they're being blessed by your show, that absolutely, you know. Pour something into that. Pour something into the the show, like you were you were asking. You know, just that it's listener supported. So honor it. If you like it, honor it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah, Good man. Stuff. <laughs> Yeah, people want to support, you know, P, I, that's my thing, you know, people want to give, you just got to give them um, avenues and, and and reasons to give and ways to give, you know, and uh, make sure that yeah. we're giving back. And I think that, you know, what we're doing with, with the teaching and equipping and um, and helping people where they are, meeting people where they're at, what I'm doing with this and Kingdom Talks and, and your ministry, what you're doing, very similar, reaching out to marginalized people. Um maybe at, at a time they were marginalized. Now they're stepping out and taking over, you know, all the next stagers and people who are having, you know, otherworldly encounters yeah. with the Lord and with beings and angels and things like that. And there really isn't like a grid for what they're experiencing in the church realm. And so for me, it led me, I, I had to go outside the church to even find somebody to talk to about this stuff. And so for what I'm yeah. doing and what you guys are yeah. doing, stepping into the next age, 
kind of creating a grid. The grid's been there. I really, I think it has been scripturally even, but in, in Christendom, you know, in the church age, it's kind of, you know, been taboo to talk about some of these things. And so it's very important right now. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a shame that it's been taboo, but you know, I guess that's just the way it is. One of the things that I, I think has been really uh, exciting for people that, um, you know, they've come to our, our church, you know, and they um, find out that there's a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom. Uh, and, you know, we had a, a, a baptism some time ago and, and, uh, you know, I felt like this is one of the first baptisms I was doing into this next age where we were, we're aware. We don't fully understand what we're stepping into, but we're aware that we're stepping into something. And this person brought their family over, you know, they brought their, their, their mother and their father and their cousin over. And uh, the four of us sat down together with a couple other people in our church. And um, we actually had conversation where uh, they were just blown away because we were open to having conversation about things that were taboo in the church. And, you know, we went down a lot of rabbit holes. And to me, we don't, we will not be able to discover the truth unless we are able to have conversations, open conversations, and without somebody stepping in and saying, well, I've got all the truth, let me tell you how it is, because that just shuts everything down. But to have conversation and let everybody discover on their own path what is working for them? Because I do believe that the other thing that we're stepping into is, is the age of we will all be taught of the Lord. And so the key to all of it is having a personal and intimate relationship with Yahweh, with Yeshua, with Holy Spirit. And when we have that personal relationship, they will be the ones that guide us. And that needs to be left alone so that we're not trying to tell everybody, you got to do it this way or you got to do it that way. But Rather, you know, we're, you know, we do want to have one another's backs, um, not stabbing each other in the back. That's kind of been the, <laughs> the yeah. past paradigm. It's like someone looks like they're getting off course and we got to start, you know, you know, mm-hmm. taking them down some way. But rather that we have one another's back and just, you know, in a loving way, be able to share, hey, you know, not sure if the fruit of that is is really looking good on you right now. Uh, and that that person would know that we're operating out of love. And that we really want to help the person that we're not trying to stop them because I'm not afraid of anything anymore. Um, you know, people want to step into stuff that would have been totally taboo in the past. I'm like, I'm not afraid of it. You know, if that's what God's calling you to do, we got your back, you know, and maybe there's another person over here. They'll go with you. I don't know. But, you know, we want to have one another's backs and begin to explore things <clears throat> that we've not been able to explore in the past just because it's always been shut down. Yeah, and it's working. It, I think it's so simple too. It's not like some crazy big formula. Maybe it seems like it is when you're a forerunner, you know, especially I mean, you could probably look back when you guys were stepping into this, you know, and you know, is anybody going to respond? I know this is where God's leading us, but then you're like seeing how big and how addictive love is, you know, God's love and uh yeah. and, and and inviting people into that and seeing how God was already preparing people. You know, and all you had to do yeah. was really have the conversation and, you know, create the grid or the, the platform to do that. And um, and, and when we're, we're not alone, there's a lot of people doing this. And I think we've been forerunners in in a sense in, in a lot of that. Um, and it's as simple as having a conversation, you know, and I have people on from all walks of life and even Christians who maybe do things that I don't agree with. or don't I don't believe in or or maybe the people watching don't <laughs> agree with or believe in. And yeah. uh and people think you are you automatically you know what I'm saying believe in that or you you um, vouch for their lifestyle or what they're doing, but it's like hold on, like simply we're having a conversation, and 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 you find that like the church realm or the religious realm they kind of get upset that you're having the conversation with that person because it's this it's the the one simple thing that they refuse to do, you know, in organized religion, the church realm and stuff like that is they refuse to have that conversation. Like, it's not that I believe in this person. It's not that I, you know, vouch for their lifestyle. I'm just having a conversation with this person, you know, and it's the one thing that we, you know, refuse to do. Um, And there's a, there's a clip and I want to show you this clip event off camera, but um, the, uh, when Columbine happened, uh, Marilyn Manson, I was a big, really big into Marilyn Manson when I was a teenager. He caught the, the brunt of that, of these kids being into this dark music and, the occult and stuff like that. And they went on that rampage and, uh, 
um, Mar- Marilyn Manson caught the brunt of that, and he was trying to say he was responsible, and he his lyrics and all kind of stuff, and he had to go off grid. And and uh, some years later, he resurfaced and he did his first interview, and his first interview was with Michael Moore, and he did it was on the the docu- uh, documentary um, uh, 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 Bowling for Columbine, and so he had this first interview with Marilyn Manson, and then they start talking to him about you know the repercussions from uh Columbine like him you know they saying he did it and boycotting his music and all this just crazy stuff and um Michael Moore sits him down and he's picking his brain about it and he said he said Manson if you could sit down with these with these teenagers and you can tell them one thing what would you tell them if you can sit down and talk to them he said I wouldn't tell them anything he said I would listen to them and that's what nobody ever did nobody ever listened to these kids you know and so for us just to have that conversation, man, with people who are hurting, man, people who even have ideas and there's no grid and there's no realm for just having that conversation, you know, it's so powerful, man. And so when, yeah. when he said that, man, it, it's like, man, floor, like everybody's giving their opinion, do this, try that, go here. I said, look, we just, we just open up room for the conversation, man. And I feel like there's so much healing and the transference of, of energy and knowledge and wisdom and love that's transferred through a conversation, you know, as long as we're willing to have it with the person and you got to try to convert them. I used to have the conversation that, that, but the goal yeah. was to convert yeah. them at the end. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I know you did too. <laughs> yeah. It's been a, a major shift. And, and again, I believe that this is something that God is doing. You know, it's not something that, you know, man is going to be able to mess up in any way, shape or form. He's simply taking us to a whole new, and I'll just call it the, the evolution of the of humanity. He's taking us to a whole new level. And it's interesting, you know, we haven't uh, talked a lot about it, but you've had Chris Carter on here before who mm-hmm. talks about the shifting of the ages and how we've gone through, uh, let's see, it would have been from Adam and Eve, you know, that was one shift when they came out of the garden. You've got another shift with Abraham. You've got another shift with Yeshua. And then now we're in another shift. Yeah. And uh, in each shift, you know, there are some massive changes that take place. And even though there was a, a commission, now I would say that it, you know, it looks very clear that God has always used his people to orchestrate the, tra- the, the transition. And, um, and yet the commission that was given in the previous age seldom is very well fulfilled before God says, okay, we're going to the next stage, which is really interesting. He's definitely not hung up on perfection in the sense that everybody's got to get it right and they got to have it all done and finished and complete before he goes to the next stage. No, he's taking his ship, you know, this earth in the direction that he wants to take it. He is sovereign and he's going to take it in that direction no matter what. He's got a plan for humanity and he's taking us in that direction. Now, we obviously have choices in the process and we can choose to cooperate and enter into it or we can choose to fight it and do our own thing. Um, but there's a whole lot more fun if we choose to cooperate and move with him in it, I think. Yeah. If not, you'd be left behind. <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, people who are stuck in religious mindsets and uh, religion mm-hmm. for the sake of religion, you know, the raptures come and they've been left behind, <laughs> you know, symbolically, you know, and yeah. uh, if you, you have to change with the times. And I think with with each each age and with each dispensa- uh, dispensation of grace, you've seen at the precipice people who weren't willing to make that change, people who weren't willing to listen to what the voice of the Lord was doing for Noah. It was just him and his family, you know, and then for, for each one stepping into the promised land, there were those people who wouldn't go for, you know, the, in, in, in the new Testament, the, re, the return of Christ or the end of the world is those who weren't willing to leave that place that was comfortable to them. And Christ said, look, when you see these signs, it's time to move to the next phase, go, to the mountains. If not, you're going to be left behind. And, uh, and with yeah. each, each shift of the ages, um, there's, there's a decision to make. And, and those decisions mm-hmm. are going on within our own lives, within our own seasons. If we're going to, you know, prepare the way so that we can, uh, be able to receive that we can be fruitful and prosper in those next seasons in our lives. And literally they are the seasons and, uh, the, the scriptures is, um, uh, it's clear, you know, that the earth and the, the, the inhabitants of the earth is making its way throughout the uh, the Zodiac, the houses of the Zodiac, you know. And so those are yeah. the ages. Yeah. And so, yeah. we, you know, Jesus brought in the age of Pisces and 
we're stepping into the age of Aquarius and there there's a lot of changes and uh but there are all those people who want to hold on you know and they don't want to uh make those changes and just want to do it the way it's been done and again you can look back over the scriptures as the change in you know the age of Taurus you know and all the changes that's come like people want to hold on to the way and they get left behind so let's talk for a minute because I've shared this on a few other talks I've done but um uh you know, when Adam and Eve came out of the garden, so they went from Gemini to uh, to uh, Taurus, okay? And again, anybody who's listening, these are, it's in the Bible, the Maseroth. Uh, we call it the Zodiac today, but it's the Maseroth in, in the Hebrew language. So um, going from Gemini to people, okay, um, which is interesting. Again, Gemini is represented by two people, Adam and Eve in the garden, okay? And so they come out of the garden, the event that kind of closes the door for one age and opens it up for the next age is the exodus from the garden. And um, when you step into the age of Taurus, well, now this is the age where they were sacrificing bulls and, and so forth. So, I mean, it's very fitting, the age of Taurus, the bull. And then the next age that you shift into is the age of uh, Aries and it's Abraham who is taking his son up to sacrifice him and is, is stopped and, and pointed to the ram in the bushes. Aries is the lamb or the ram. And we go into the age of, um, uh, you know, sacrificing of, you know, lambs much more so than the bulls. And then you come to Jesus and Jesus then takes us into, like you said, the age of Pisces from Aries to Pisces. And um, the, the event there and by the way, the event, you know, that we looked at was one person, Abraham, and his encounter with God. And that was what we look at as kind of the shift where one door closed and we're, you know, stepping straight into uh, Aries at that point. And um, so that's one, one person. Adam and Eve were two people, but it kind of very um, singular event, small event. Abraham, very small, singular event, one man. But then you get to the age of, of going from Aries to Pisces. And you've got Jesus who has given this, you know, the, the words basically saying, hey, people, we're shifting. We're going into the age to come. We're co Here it comes. And then the event that we look at is this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And now this affects a whole people and a whole nation. And that is the door, we believe, we look at that. That is the, where the door closed to Aries and we step into Pisces, fish. The age of the fish. Jesus had fishermen. You know, so we have all these signs and symbols. And there's so much in, in the Bible and the scriptures that you know, we can look at to see these shifts. And now we come to the age where we're shifting from Pisces into Aquarius. And it's like, well, what might that event be that would say, okay, the door to Pisces is closed. We need to be really focusing and shifting into Aquarius. I don't know. And we will only know really when we step up and when we look in hindsight, probably, but this coronavirus affected the entire world. It shut down the entire world. What has ever happened in history that shut down the entire world? Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I can't say for sure, but I am absolutely leaning toward the idea that that Pisces, the sign for the door being closed, is this coronavirus, and that we are stepping into, and we really need to begin to focus on. What are we to be doing? How do we worship? How do we uh, engage with God in this age of Aquarius, where we are actually being given the tools and the spiritual technology to step into the fullness of mature sons? And to me, a mature son looks and acts like Jesus. So we have the love of Jesus, and we have the power and authority that Jesus had. And he said that we would do all the works that he did and much more. And what works did he do? We tend to limit it to, you know, he, he healed the sick, he raised the dead and all that. But he's also the one, and we can see it in Colossians, that all things were created through him. All things that we know of are were created through him. So what does it mean when he says we're going to do much more? Well, I will say that we are definitely like one step into a thousand step journey, but uh, uh, I believe we're on it. We're absolutely on it. And we got a lot to look forward to. But yeah, we're, so we're, box, yeah, we're being made <laughs> and conformed into his image. And uh, and and um, when we catch a glimpse of that, man, how powerful that is, you know, whatever that glimpse is, whatever aspect or fractal, if you will, of God 
um, that we get, the revelation just blows our minds. And, and so we, we I feel like we all get, um, we all have our fractal, our peace of God and anything that you can imagine is in that, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Anything that is created, any imagination, any thought it is, it comes out of the one, out of that as- aspect. And so people get, uh, um, obsessed or infatuated with this one aspect that they've seen. And I know there was periods of your life and we have friends who are still there who were just infatuated with the judgment of God and the wrath of God. And, you know, and this is what you, you know, and that I really feel like that's a valid piece of God. But that's the piece that they're infatuated with. That's the piece that they're holding on to. Um, hopefully they, you know, the the other side is a lot more fun. It's a lot more freeing to walk in the freedom of God the fractal of the love of God and just keep going into the love of God, going into the grace of God, into the power of God, you know? So those are the things that we, we try to uh, encourage the people that, that they'll be able to, you have to step back. So when you're going into a fractal, it just keeps getting more dense. I mean, there's so mm-hmm. many, there's so many uh, uh, reflections and pieces yeah. and, and rabbit holes, if you will, but we have to be able to step back from, the uh, micro I'm able to see the macro see God for who he is and and with my book and I know it's similar to what you believe that's the sovereignty of God how it's just yeah. everything how it works together the interconnectedness of it all and just to be able to appreciate it now even though I, I may not agree or or have much uh I don't want to promote it or anything like that but the the people who are into the judgment of God and the wrath of God, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think it's valid. I respect it. Like I respect mm-hmm. where they are. You know what I'm saying? Because they're infatuated with this piece. Now I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to try to love on them. I'm going to, sh- I'm going to try to uh, be an image and an example of, of what a mature son looks like. Um, Cause that's not the fullness of God. The fullness of God is not his wrath. You know what I'm saying? The fullness of God is not his judgment. It is his judgment, oh, yeah. but there's like, there's good stuff in judgment too. It's not like condemnation or damning or no. depart from me and stuff like that. Like God's judgments are good. You know what I'm saying? Well, and that, that's such an important point. But one of the things I think we, we're going to have to learn to do as we step into this next age is we're going to have to learn to deconstruct so much of what we've been taught. And we don't have to necessarily go and deconstruct everything, but we do need to relook at where we stand with everything. Because one of the things that will you'll realize is that the church has taught us a lot of things. And again, I respect and honor and love the church. Um, however, there are certain areas where it has taught us things because it's kind of just been regurgitated down through the centuries. And it really almost gives us the opposite view of what I see in scripture. And just a real simple one, you know, the word Dan in Hebrew is the same word for judge. It's our you know, English word for is judge. And, and the word Dan in Hebrew is made with two Hebrew letters. And, you know, letters in the Hebrew are pictogram or, you know, they're, they're pictures. So um, it's made of the letter Dalit and Noon. Dalit is door and Noon is life. So judge is a door to life. And when we understand that to be judged is basically judging us to life, and we realize, wait a minute, we've taken this whole thing of judgment and we put it into this <laughs> negative context yeah. that when I'm judged, I'm just, I'm just waiting for that big God in the sky to uh, find something wrong with me so he can kick me out. And it's just the opposite. It's like God saying, I want to judge you <laughs> to life. I want to help find the things in you that keep us separated and help you eliminate those things so that there's no more separation. Yep. And to be honest, there's really never been any separation, but we can get into that later if you want to. But um, just the fact that, you know, Jesus says he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. That's his judgment. He wants to give us life more abundantly. Yeah. So let's, let's you know, get off the bandwagon that, you know, God's out to get us and he's bringing judgment to destroy us and all this stuff. No, if there's any type of judgment he's bringing, he's bringing judgment in order to save us. Yeah. And he may be working some things out of us, and it may be uncomfortable as he works those things out of us. But mm-hmm. he is gearing us up to be like Jesus. And if we just, I like to go into the heavens and just say, okay, Lord, judge me. You know, I'll, I'll know that, okay, there's something off here. I don't know what yeah. it is, you know, but there's something off. I want to go into the heavens, and I want to stand before 
God as my judge and say, judge me, please judge me. I want to know what is in me that's not right so that yeah, I can be in a wicked way. Yeah. yeah. Search my heart. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to be judged. Bring it on. <laughs> um, you know, and, 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 you know, the funny thing about this is like it's um, um, on earth as it is in heaven. Right. So what's going on in the heavens, the uh, progression of the Zodiac, the Zodiac or the Maseroth. And as we're traveling in these seasons, um, that happens as above, so below, as within, so without. So what's going on out there is also going on in here. We are a reflection. I feel like there's an eternity outside of us, but there's also eternity within us. And it's a mirror image of what's going on in, in heaven. You can get into the anatomy of the body and of the mind and see how it mirrors the scriptures and revelations and all of that kind of stuff. It's like just th these different metaphors about what's going on uh, internally. Um, so whenever there's the coming of the next age and we look in the scriptures, there was always a judgment, right? There was always a judgment of Israel. There was always a, a judgment of even Christ going through the judgment, you know, and just the, the different ages as we shift into the next age. But that's going on internally as well. Judge me, O Lord. See if there be any way, wicked way within me. Try me. Um, and the scripture says that a spiritual man judges all things. Um, and it's, it kind of is, is, is also um, likened to... to um, um, doing the self-examination to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith and make in trying to get any impurity anything out of you because we're being refined it's part of the sanctification process but as we look in the scriptures and seeing how they moved from one age to the next or from one season to the next and there was a coming judgment we also must go through that judgment internally and if there, there's things that that are within you that you can't bring to the next season the next stage that God has you going through. There's some things that you got to leave at the door. There's some things that you got to crucify. There's some things that you have to sacrifice. All of those mm -hmm. things are symbolic for, but just it's welcoming the process, you know, and it, it's, it's not easy, but once you get familiar with it, once you get familiar with uh, s some of the things and you've done it before, you know, you've been through the fire, you know that it's a refiner's fire and it's a good thing. And, and God, the scripture says, God, God chastises those in whom he loves. You got to go through yep. the judgment. It's a good judgment. If I'm bitter, Lord, yep. take it out of me. I don't want hidden yes. bitterness. I don't want envy. I don't. And it's what we call sin, falling short of the glory, missing the mark. God's dealing with those hidden and, 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 and wounds and those things that were implanted when we were children and hurts and all. He's getting all of that stuff out so that we can operate out of the spirit and walk in peace, love, unity, harmony. Uh, not only with with God, but with each other and all creation. And we're talking about the animals. We're talking about the uh, spirits, the angels. You know, we can keep going into that. But to yeah. to be at harmony and at peace with any and everything that God has created. That's so good. So good. You know, um, I, I, I do just want to encourage because one of the things that I absolutely believe is that as we step into this next age, we're going to be moving away from the intellectual um, religion and stepping more into the spiritual religion. And I, I just interviewed Dr. Kay Fairchild um, last week. And, you know, and I love one of the things that she teaches and I can't do it justice. Uh, you'd have to go look her up and, and check it out. But um, but she talks about, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the white horse being our spiritual connection. That's Yeshua. You know, that's our engagement with the heavens in Yeshua. And then the black horse being our engagement with intellect. And again, you'd have to go back and listen to her describe it because she gets into great deal. The red horse is our emotions. And then the pale horse is the body. And um, that not any one of them. And, and again, you've got to go listen to her teaching. So I'm giving it a very short summarized mm -hmm. version, but um, the, 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 the black horse, the red horse and the pale horse, they represent again, the intellect, the emotions and the body. There's nothing wrong with them. God created them. They're <laughs> awesome. But the thing is they all need to be submitted to the white horse or to the spiritual aspect because intellect on its own is not going to get us very far in our relationship with God. 
emotions on its own. You know, we can have these great aesthetic, you know, emotional experiences, but that alone is not going to get you very far with the Father. Um, I mean, they are great. They're good. There's nothing wrong with them. But, you know, the body, you know, it's not going to get us very far. But when we submit these and we combine them with our, I saw somebody say it earlier, the single eye, you know, Jesus talks about if your eye be single, you know, that, you know, that we want to have our body full of light. And it's in that place of meditation that we are able to enter into this place where we can submit our emotions and our intellect and the body so that yeah. through the spiritual encounter, that's where we level up. And that's where the encounter just becomes so incredible and so real that uh, mm. that's where we're headed. I mean, and I think we have to be able to step into this in order to evolve to the next level in this age of Aquarius. Or, you know, some other language we use or that you could use, you know, people listening so that you don't trigger people who get, you know, totally triggered by the, uh, the uh, um, uh, you know, the idea of astrology. But use, uh, using church age and then we're moving into the kingdom age, where in the kingdom age we're basically totally open to letting people be led by the Lord and we're not doing denominations, we're not building walls. We are taking those walls down so that we can engage with one another in conversation and learn from another one another in love. Amen. And if it's done in love, then it's done. In, it's done of the spirit and it's of God. If it's of love and I don't care yeah. what it looks like again, like I've said it a million times, I'd rather hang out with the spiritual Hindu than the carnal Christian, a spiritual Hindu <laughs> who walks in love and walks in grace yeah. and, and shows yeah. mercy and compassion. Uh, last night on our school of the mystic sessions, we, we read the, uh, um, the, uh, the parable of the, um, uh, good Samaritan. And it says, you know, who is my brother? You know, is it, is it the Jew? Is it the one, is it the, the, is it the worshiper? Is it the one who, uh, is keeping the law? Is it the one who's keeping the commandments and it's showing this person who is, who we would consider to be outside of our, of our community outside of, of who God accepts. We'll say that. And that was the person who came and did the good alms and helped the person in need. And he's like asking who is our brother? And he's like, listen, that's your brother. You see what he's doing? Go and do the same, go and do likewise. And so God doesn't judge us according to our religion. God doesn't, uh, uh judge us according to our outward appearance because that's how we judge we look at the outward appearance and oh, okay i see what's going on we want to put people in boxes and compartmentalize but god judges by the deeds of the heart and you find out something interesting is the majority of what the the, the deeds of the heart are done in secret <laughs> people don't know you can see what i do in in public or what i film or what we talk about on the podcast but the things that we're doing in secret that that's where the real treasure is and so that's what makes somebody a christian or somebody uh, a child of god is because they walk in the light as it, as he is in the light and so it's the beauty that's how we weigh things now we weigh it with a measure of love and and who yeah. and i and i'm saying who is walking in love is my brother you know and and that's that's universal yeah. For me, and uh, and even you know some of the hard stuff that we go through in the sp in the spirit realms and stuff that may seem hard if we say demonic or you know trials like we're it's it's for our good it's it's done out of love and so love it, it's yeah. not always we we do have to be uh, careful I know I talked to you last time about this is the fact that just letting anything flow letting anything go. Uh, we do have to uh, to be careful sometimes about because people take liberty and they just run with it. And, you know, it leads sometimes it could lead to some weird, weird situations. Yeah. But I think that there's a learning process in it all. But uh, again, if it's done of, of love, I think that uh, it, we're supposed to judge by the fruit, as the scripture says, you know, don't, don't judge by appearance, judge by the fruit. Yeah. A good tree yeah. produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. And you're going to be able to partake of that fruit as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and that's why, you know, I, I don't know if you mind me mentioning um, our, our website. Is that all right? No or? websites. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, on, on Kingdom Talks Media uh, dot com, you've you've actually signed this this uh, pledge that we put out with the three plumb lines. Yeah. And I just am, up, am so excited. Right back there. So yeah. I can look at it while I'm here and I can always remember. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that's where I think we're headed to where, you know, that's what's just one of those amazing things that Father downloaded in the spirit. And it, it actually came over about a six to nine month period. 
but those three plumb lines are so simple and yet so synergistic. And, you know, the first one is the cross of Christ. And if you and I believe that uh, Yeshua is the only way to the Father and the only way to eternal life, then we're on a similar path. So let's walk together as brothers. Uh, and then the second one is to love, honor, and respect. And that just brings in the aspect and the fact, okay, the fact that you, me, and everyone else on the planet are going to have different interpretations of different scriptures and that we're not going to completely agree on everything. And it's okay that we would love, honor, and respect one another and even love, honor, and respect each other's views so that we can, you know, grow. You know, and even though I may disagree with somebody, um, I can at least take the time to respect their point of view and look at it and uh, understand it because, hey, they may be right. I may be wrong. So <laughs> I'll never know yeah. if I don't take the time to give it a good, honest look. And then the third one is ask the Father. And, you know, that requires us to be able to engage with the Father and to step into the heavens. Or, you know, there may be a lot of different ways that people are engaging with the Father, and that's fine. But the thing is, ask the Father. Yeah. Because what you were bringing up just a minute ago about uh, you can't just let anything go. You can't just, you know, go with the flow and do whatever you feel like doing because there's still some things in us that, you know, tend to uh, take us down, you know, yeah. a, you know, away from God versus oh, yeah. toward him. But ask the Father. And, and if the Father gives you the okay, then then go for it. Now, again, there may be those who have a really misconstrued relationship or non-relationship with the Father, yeah. uh, and it's kind of messed up. Uh, that's why community is important, because if you get outside of community, then uh, it can get pretty pretty messy sometimes. But even in communities, I mean, obviously, you know, we, you know, uh, David, was it David Koresh? Um <laughs> You know, yeah. there, there, you know, a lot of different people and, you know, Jim Jones, obviously there have been communities that have just gone off the wall. And unfortunately, it's going to happen. You know, I don't know. There's usually communes right now, that go off the wall when you turn it into a commune. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, you know, those things are going to happen. But the thing is, don't let that stop you and keep you from having a, a strong, healthy community of love where you're, you're stepping into what the father's doing. Yeah. So. You know, that that's the enemy's tactic. He will get in and he will mess with some great things that God is doing. And then everybody else goes, I don't want anything to do with that. And it's like, don't do that. Ask the Father and keep moving forward in love and what he's giving to you. Yeah. Yeah, community and um, and even like cross-pollinating those communities too will, will help you um, be able to decipher like the good and perfect will of God. Like, because, you know, versus being in uh, what we see big now you have a lot of people who are into like confirmation bias you only hang out with those people who agree with you you only hang out with those people who look like you and if you don't believe in this then we can't be friends or we're not going to be in community together and so having new ideas and then having um other people who can um lovingly judge you you know what i'm saying lovingly judge you openly not not gossip that's different gossip about you that's different but lovingly judge you ask you hey man what's what's going on in this tell me a little bit more is this you know just getting some information about it because the confirmation bias you'll find people who start communities or whatever communes um who only have those yes men in their corner who are only telling them what they want to hear and they're own, they're cool with it and so it could be some way crazy off the wall stuff and as long as me and my community is cool with it it flies and you get into some really weird things so i think that that's why like true community is not just our, our church or our, you know, 20 people or for however many people you have, but it's about being open to people um, who are leaders and, and, and who walk in integrity, who can, um, you know, where you want to use the word judge or, or, or um, disciple or um, there's a lot of words for it to, to help you to make sure that you haven't just created this little cult, you know, right. where nobody you, you're above reproach. No matter how big of a leader or how much angelic wisdom you've received from the heavens, like you have to be open to to scrutiny and judgment and you have to be able to uh, like laugh at, you know, you, the stuff that you take seriously. You have to be able to listen to opposing views um, again, stepping out of like confirmation bias, like you know, only listening to those people. And, you know, I, I asked the hard questions I've had. I had Dr. O on here and. Like, it, and it's not a dig. I don't want people to feel like I'm marginalizing or calling them out. But you have to, maturity is, is 
you being able to hear somebody who disagrees with your stance and your point and you knowing that this is where God called you to and that I'm open for correction and I'm open for 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 scrutiny. And if it's truth at the end of the day, it's going to stand. It's going to last. Whatever's true. Truth is, is yeah. going to stand. So yeah. I really believe in that. And um, if anything, you know, when I, when I get somebody like Dr. O or just anybody who disagrees with with something that anybody's doing, um, if anything, you you at least know their stance. You know what they believe about that topic. You know, so yeah. it's not about. I want. I just want to make sure that's that's out there too, because like, yeah, I quit. Like, I'm a I'm a Berean. Like, I, I play the devil's advocate a lot. I think that that's a way that we we cover new ground. That we uh, uh, can can question what we believe. That we can um, you know do the inner work as far as um, you know proving what we believe and making sure why we believe it. Because a lot of people in religion, they believe stuff and they can't tell you why they believe it. They believe it because they were told it. <laughs> they were that's told what to point. believe. Yeah. You know, and that's why, I, you know, sometimes I, I mean, I don't do this in a mean way, in any, mm -hmm. any way, shape or form. But, you know, if there's opportunity to where I can, if it, if it is going to help to for someone else to see that uh, that what they're believing might be wrong. You know, it's it's just it's just to say, prove it. Yeah, because. Honestly, I don't know that there's much in this world that we can prove without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Because if you, if you keep diving in and you keep going down the rabbit holes, you're going to find that, wait a minute, there's a question. There, you can put nearly everything to question. <laughs> and there's really yeah. not much we can prove in this world. Now, there's yeah. a ton of evidence, ton of yeah. evidence for a lot of things. But to prove something beyond a shadow of a doubt, and that's why I, I, you know, I keep preaching and teaching, hold everything loosely, because, you know, I may be holding on to something that I absolutely believe is truth, and I'm not going to be swayed one way or another. Not even God himself is going to teach me something. I've got this, and I'm going to hold on to it. Well, unfortunately, you're, you're basically just literally have stopped yourself from learning anything else. And, you know, we are all on a journey to learn. And I don't think there's anybody listening to this that can say that, you know, they are, they believe a hundred percent of what they believed 10 years ago. You know, we've all grown. We've all stepped into new things. We all are understanding that there's new things to learn that go above and beyond what we might've thought we knew back then. So to take something that I think I know and to press it onto somebody else and say, you've got to believe this. And unfortunately that is what I did. I mean, you know, yeah. you, you and I were just talking about that, but that we've, you know, really been the Bible beating people where we beat people over the heads to get them to believe something that we were just absolutely convinced was truth. Yeah. When in reality, now I can look back at that and, and, you know, I'm just like, man, I'd love to go back and apologize to so many of those people because all I was doing was taking what I thought I knew at the time, what I thought was truth, and I was trying to impose it on them rather than having a conversation where we could actually talk about things. And I might have learned something back then. I yeah. don't know. I was pretty stubborn back then. <laughs> I'm the same way, you know, looking back and trying to learn. But I think I think um, I think we did, though. Right. Because there's a lot of people who haven't been gifted that uh, of going through, you know, what we went through as far as thinking that you were right and trying to win people. There's a lot of Christians, even like me and you talk about this openly, but there's a lot of people like in our communities and stuff who have never like been into that hardcore debate prove it in the scripture and, and talking yeah. people out of their faith. They've never even been a part of that. We talk about it openly. We think everybody's been a part of that, but you know, just cause it was so normal and we had, you know, friends who were into it. We trained people on how to do it. We were trained on how to do it. And so, but there's a gift in it because now we can look back and we've got a contrast of what like this staunt judgment and trying to talk somebody out of their beliefs and all of that kind of stuff looks like versus listening to a person yeah. and honoring them where they are. Even if I don't agree with it, uh, we can have the conversation. We, you know, I, I do think the, the tricky thing comes in with evangelism of still, because we came from that, if not to be like, Hey, whatever, man, cool. You love Buddha. Cool. That's awesome. You know, versus <laughs> like still wanting to share the gospel and the truth that we've found through Jesus, you know, so there it, that it gets tricky with the universalism and things like that, that Jesus died for for everyone. So I don't need even need to tell you because it'll give you a chance to reject it or something like that. There are some some hurdles and things that we have to get over with being so open, even if it's just for a conversation, but still being, um, 
you know, preaching the gospel. Uh, but I think yeah. the, the biggest part of preaching the gospel for maybe us coming into where we are now is, is doing it with our lifestyle and making sure that our lifestyle preaches the gospel. And, uh, and, and then our words will carry more weight. Our words will carry more power when it's time to tell you what we really believe or share the gospel. Because we're share we're literally sharing it through our lifestyle anyway, and that's what those who preach the gospel don't understand. They they they. I got people who don't care how you're living as long as you're proclaiming the word. And for me, I'm the other way around. Like I want your lifestyle to be lined up with the person of Jesus and let him do the inner work on you. So then when you do preach, when you do share, people want to know what must I do to be saved, man? What is it that you have that I don't have? So your words carry more weight and more power because your lifestyle lines up with your message. That's good. That's good. You know, one of the things that, and when I look back to those days when, you know, beating everybody over the head with the Bible and what I thought was the truth, uh, pride really plays a big part in that, that, you know, I can look back at that and say, I, I did a lot of that because I wanted to be right. In fact, I had to be right. And the reason I had to be right was because I was so insecure yeah. that honestly, I did not believe, and I, this is the honest truth, that back then, <laughs> I did not believe that God loved me. Yeah. Um, you know, I could say it mentally kind of, a you know, give, give it credence in that way, but I honestly did not believe God loved me. I did not love myself. I hated myself. And so here I am trying to preach this gospel about this loving God, and yet I didn't actually have it in me myself. And so here's the another thing for this next stage that we're moving into. It is going to be so important for us as believers to understand how important it is for us to love ourselves well to love ourselves as God loves us. Because if we don't, we're gonna, we're, everything else is going to be skewed. Because if we don't love ourselves, then we are walking in insecurity of who we really are. We don't even know who we truly are if we don't love ourselves as God loves us. And out of that insecurity, we will belittle others. We will put others down. We, will, we might do it nicely, but we're still yeah. going to say, oh, they're wrong and I'm right. And, you know, Blah, blah, blah. We do that because we're walking in insecurity. If I'm totally confident in who I am, I can engage someone who totally hates me and totally disregards everything I think and say, and I can be okay and still love them and not be bent out of shape over it if I truly love myself, if I truly know who I am in Christ. And yet if I don't, then I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to be trying to convince everybody that I'm right. I have the truth because I have to build myself up otherwise, because I don't have anything else to, to have confidence in. I have to build up my platform of me and my pride so I can stand on that above everybody else. And that's just the way it's going to happen. So take away that. Engage with somebody who truly loves themselves, knows who they are, is confident in themselves, and they're going to love on you even if they disagree with you. <laughs> what would you have said if you could talk to your uh, former self if you told yourself that? What would the younger you have said? If say, hey man, you're just, you're just insecure, you don't really believe this stuff and you need to convince. You probably, even if somebody told you that in love and walking in the spirit, you probably still wouldn't have received it at that point, right? Probably not. It probably, probably would not. have planted a seed though, right? Yeah, probably what would have been most effective, and I did. There were people that engaged with me that that were walking in a better place of that love. Mm -hmm. And those people, when you're around them, you're at peace. You don't feel threatened. Um, you know, there's just, there, there's just that uh, frequency that they put off yeah. when they are truly walking in love. They love you. And you may be saying things that they disagree <laughs> with, but it's okay. They're not yeah. sitting there trying to win an argument over. They're more about just sharing and the love and just loving on yeah. you. And that's what would have been effective, you know, for me. And it was effective, mm -hmm. but I, you know, again, I had to grow into it. You, but if anybody could hear this and just know, hey, if I'm operating in a place where I think I got to be right, wow, that might be a sign that I'm not completely loving myself as God mm -hmm. loves me. And that would be the place to go focus on. Go engage with the Father and continue to just sit in his presence until you can fully receive everything that he's pouring out into that every good thing that he's saying about you that you can receive it and then begin to walk in it walk it out 
that's the incredible part. That's the that's the part that you know we want to um, uh, you know find that place of peace and rest in confidence of who we are in Him. Yeah, I like to say I gave up my right to be right. You know, yeah. I gave up my, and that was of me trying to win a conversation. And uh, and I had those people in my life too. Uh, but it's all a learning experience, you know. And there was, and yeah. and God is the author and finisher of my faith, and He led me down that road for a reason. There was things that I had to learn, and I had to. I know what it feels like. I have a natural empathy for people who are in in those seasons in their life, and so. Um, the guy who led me to the Lord, you know, I remember, and I got into all kind of deep stuff and nationality stuff and Hebrew Israelites. And I remember I, I had all my prophetic books, I had a whole library and I was like, and they gave me books and I would, I like gave them away. I was like, man, I don't want these books. I just want the Bible, you know, all kind of just weird stuff. And so, um, we'd have conversations and stuff and, uh, and just in, in love, but they would be like, um, the guy who led me to the Lord, he'd be like, uh, you know, it's all about love, Derek. That's all I know. At the end of the day, it all comes back down to love. And I didn't—I remember, like, I didn't want to hear that at the time because it was too simple. And for some reason, I thought of like a shallow love. My, when they said love, my mind automatically went to shallow love. And like, for some mm. reason, like Joel Osteen preaches love, and that's not the—that's what everybody wants to hear. And for some reason, like my intellectual mind, the analytical mind, wanted to overcomplicate the simplicity of the gospel the simplicity yeah. of God's yeah. love. But even him saying that it still rings true in my head today. And it, it helped me out so much at in those times of questioning and in those times of being proved wrong when I was so combative and not even by a person, just the inner dialogue with the Holy spirit, you know, and this, the growth and stuff. And then so love at the end of the day, like that really is the answer. You know, he was right the whole time. He was on to something that I had to kind of grow into. Maybe I started there, but I got into some other things and I, I ended there, you know. So love really is the key that sets the captives free. And so it is simple. It's so simple that we miss it when we try to start yeah. tying r rules and regulations and uh, formulas and stuff like that to it. And it, it changes God's love and the way we view God's love because it 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 becomes a love of conditions. I believe that God's love is unconditional for all of creation. Um, yeah. And we, we begin yeah. to put g conditions on God's love and say, God loves you if, or God will accept you if. And I remember when I heard the first message of, uh, it was Carlton Pearson years ago, listening just to some, just in my seeking process, listening to him talk about reconciliation, universal reconciliation, that Jesus died for everyone. Um, I remember it changed my view of the gospel because it was something that God will forgive you versus that God has already forgiven you in the gospel. And for some reason, I thought that like you have to get these people into an encounter, get them to say the sinner's prayer. And if they do that, then God forgives them and they step right. into it. But it's like, hold on, like he already has forgiven you. Nothing can change that. You're already forgiven. And now it's my job to convey that message to you, to reconcile you back to the Father through what he's already done and you to come into the knowledge and step into that. So it's not something that God want, wants to forgive you or he might forgive you. There was even maybe even some of that. He might forgive you. Let's ask him. Let's see if he forgives you. No, he, he forgives you, man. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. Yeah, I love that. It's so good. You know, so the, the title of this, I think you put out there, Limitless Encounters with God. Um, you know, one of the things that that, that I think of when I, I think of limitlessness is um, I'll be talking with somebody and, well, let me back up. Let me just back up because I'm going to go somewhere if you're okay. Can I go yeah, somewhere that you, yeah, might, sure. you might not agree with? Yeah. Uh, I, I, we've had these conversations before, but I, I want to go a little bit deeper. Um the idea that if freedom of choice is so important to God that he has never taken it away from us, um, the Bible doesn't say anywhere that when we die, that freedom of choice is taken away. And yet so many people feel like that when they die, they're going to go into uh, a position or a place where they're judged and all their decisions that they have ever made, you know, will be kind of tallied up and they're going to go to heaven or hell based on what they've done. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and at that point, I think everybody, 
I'm going to, most people in the, in the, in the Christian world still tend to believe that it's over. It's over and freedom of choice is gone. But if we are truly eternal beings, that we are either going to go into a heaven for eternity or to a hell for eternity, uh, then why is it that all of a sudden, once we die and we're on the other side, our freedom of choice is taken away? And so this is a battle that I had all my years as a pastor, um, you know, when I was pastoring in a denomination, that we come into this world and we have very little understanding of who God is, period. We have to learn who God is while we're here. Mm -hmm. And we're here for, let's just say, 70 years, 70, 80 years that we're here for. And in this process, we get lied to, we get deceived, we get told all kinds of things. And yet through all that, we're supposed to be able to figure out the right answer and to receive Jesus. And if you don't, then when you die, you're going to go to hell and burn for eternity. So this is the, this is the dilemma that I always ran into is like, if that is the case, and God is supposed to be this loving, just God, that he's going to take us coming here into this world for, you know, again, 70, 80 years, most people. Um, and we have to make the right decision in that 70, 80 year period. Or if we don't, we're going to burn in hell forever based on that 80 year period where we didn't have all the information. It wasn't clear to us. We were lied to and deceived in the process. And yet that's what the church has taught us, that if we don't make yeah. the right decision, we will burn in hell forever. Mm -hmm. So that never sat well with me, and I didn't have any answers to it until I started stepping into the heavens and really asking the Father. And in my encounters with the Father, he didn't address any of that in the beginning. In the beginning, it was just that loving, loving on me to first get me to a place where I could love myself. And then from that place of loving myself, uh, and, and understanding who, how loving God is, because God is love, you know, that he is love. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, this whole hell thing doesn't make a lot of sense. And I know I'm going to tweak a lot of people here, <laughs> but, but number one, as I began to relook at scripture, as I began to relook at scripture, I began to see that, okay, wait a minute, even in the strongest importance, which came 1800 years later, and we know that language changes over time. Um, even when you're looking at the Strong's Concordance, you still see multiple different ways that a word could be translated. And so when people are translating the Bible, they are going to translate whether they like to or not, whether they, you know, even want to. It is very difficult to do anything without some of the human bias in place. So they have been, you know, the most of the Bibles that have come out have come out under the, um, the, the paradigm of this hell. And so, therefore, the words that they chose to use to interpret, you know, uh, in Scripture, uh, give us this idea that, you know, and it says all over, you know, you, you can read your Bible and you get convinced that there's a hell. And, and, and then you, you start to look at it and you realize, you know, there are different ways that it could be translated. And what the Father said to me in this, in this position, he said, what is in me, in my heart, what is in me that makes me want to take scripture and make it line up with this idea that I'm going to burn, this is God speaking to me, that I'm going to burn people in hell forever. What's in me that makes me want to translate or see it that way versus then he said, why not start looking at scripture and with the intent of seeing if there's a way that it actually could be translated to where it shows that I'm a God of love versus a God that wants to burn people in hell forever. So I'm throwing that out there, and I'll let you come back and, and get Man, some. You, you have so many. On. You said so many things that uh, I can you know, speak on as far as like a heaven and hell issue. I, I feel like that's he, for here today. Like if we're walking in the heavens, that's a term that you use, right? You got to yeah. be living yeah. in heaven. Yeah. You got to be. We yeah. we have dual citizenships. We're seated with Christ in yeah. heavenly places even now as believers. Um, and just coming to the knowledge and understanding of who you are spiritually, eternally as that being. Um, so there, there's that aspect. But then, uh, you know, King David says, you know, Lord, deliver my soul from hell. Like I'm in hell now. And um, I've been there. Yeah. And we've seen the memes and heard the quotes. It's like uh, religion is for those people who uh, are afraid of hell. Spirituality is for those people who have been through hell. You know, and so I've been to 
this similar place of King David when he's like, Lord, deliver my soul out of hell. Lord, take it, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Re restore unto me the joy of my salvation. This is before the cross. This is before Jesus. So it was a state of consciousness, this place of being what we would say separated from God. And I think that in religion, we say that you're separated from God for eternity and that's hell. But it's this, this state of being where you feel like you've been isolated. You've been marginalized, that you feel like God has rejected you. He hasn't. Right. But you feel that you're in this state of consciousness where you're uh, rejected of God and things like that. And so that's where the gospel comes in. And God like demonstrates his love for us. And he's been doing that from Genesis to Revelation. Right. And so the concept of hell is in, in the Old Testament is definitely not a lake of fire. It's not a place that you go uh, for. You spend eternity if you reject Jesus. That's not it at all. So it's, it's something that. We must pass through. I think it's part of that refiner's fire, even that we must we, like we go through it. Yeah. And there's levels and and situations where we feel like we're in hell. But then, uh, you know, to step into the kingdom of heaven that is within us and outside of us as well, I believe. But um, as far as where we're going to go in eternity like this, I, I do feel like Earth. I do feel like we're like our the great white throne of judgment. Right. This uh, uh, eternal. Uh, our deeds that we do on earth, I do believe that they are powerful and echo into eternity. I do believe that we're going to be able to rejoice and look back over our lives. And I feel like um, throughout the study of scripture, maybe even some other text and stuff that it talks about, like it's almost like a sortation process, not of heaven and hell, but of jobs and roles and duties that we're going to be able to do in in eternity. And uh, in, just in some spirits have the ability to come back and teach from beyond the grave because they have let they have walked in love they've reached the level of ascension they've done what they were supposed to do and they responded with love i don't really believe in reincarnation that you get to come back and do it again and keep doing it and make that choice i don't believe in that but i do believe that once you cross your 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 deeds are weighed in your job Hey, you're going to be a doorkeeper. <laughs> and I would, I, hey, just let me in. You know, a doorkeeper is fine. But we look at um, Jesus meeting with some of uh, his masters, you know, with uh, Moses and Elijah from beyond the grave. And they continue to teach him and equip him uh, in his prayer closet. And so I believe that there's roles and things like that, that uh, in the Bible, we may call it the New Jerusalem as we step into eternity and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have different roles and responsibilities, but I don't think it is your, I don't think your role and responsibility is to burn in hell. I don't believe that either. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And, and, you know, I'm just thinking of your listeners too, right now that uh, it's like, you know, might've had some credit credibility built up until I went down that road. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, <laughs> but, it's, a, it's a conversation. I mean, and I think my big thing too, is like going back to like, when we start talking about hell, like, some like why do we like with the pride thing some of us want people to go to hell like i want hitler to burn exactly. forever i can't believe you would do something like that you deserve exactly. to burn forever i deserve to burn forever like I, I really do but it but but for the grace of god stepping into my life through the cross of christ he has pardoned me and i believe that he's done that for every soul Absolutely. every spirit every he humanity the spirit world he reconciled all things unto himself. I believe it. Amen. Amen. So, you know, part of the reason I'm going down this road is because I, I want to hit on the limitlessness. And, and, and so when, you know, when I'm having a conversation, it depends on who I'm talking with. You know, if I'm talking with someone who can, who can take a little bit of a joke, you know, yeah. uh, then, then, then I'll, I'll say to them when they're, when they're talking about wanting to see people burn in hell and, and this type of thing, um, I'm like, wow, man, the God I know is, is, is quite a bit bigger than that. Uh, cause basically if there's people that are going to burn in hell, that means Satan won. That means the enemy won. He was able to convince more people that God is a vengeful, hateful God and, and, or that he didn't exist or whatever. It's like the devil wins. And it's like, wow, he won big because, you know, makes it sound like that there's a lot of people going to wind up in hell. And my God, the one that I've come to know, he's sovereign and he's limitless. And the devil ain't going to get anything over on him. So the people, you know, I, I see some of the questions. It's like, well, what about all the wicked people that are just wicked, 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 like yeah. Hitler and others? 
I am thoroughly, thoroughly convinced that, you know, scripture is pretty clear that love never fails. Love does not fail. Yeah. So on the other side, given whatever amount of time, whether it's a day, a year, a hundred years, a billion years, I believe that God is powerful enough to come to whatever person that is and just say, hey, you know, I honestly love you. I really love you. And that whatever time it would take, that father would be able to convince that person that they are truly and honestly, completely, unconditionally loved. And I'm convinced also that anybody who knows that they are fully, completely, unconditionally loved and that they can get the healing from all the wounds that the earth realm gave them in that 70, 80 year period, that they can get the healing that they need and be convinced and fully understand that they are loved, that that will be enough for them to say, I'm in. I want you, Father. I want you and I want your love. I, I just cannot fathom that anybody who has the choice, you know, in their right mind, okay, in their right mind, without <laughs> the wounds, without the deception, yeah, without yeah. the lies, in their right mind could say, I want a miserable life in hell. I, you know, I just want to be hated and I want to hate. Or do I want to walk in love and unity and joyfulness? Yeah. Who in their right mind would choose the other? So I, I'm convinced that my God is limitless. His love is limitless and that he will eventually win everybody over because it says that every knee will bow. And if that is true, then either everybody finally comes to the place where I love you, God, and I am so eager and willing to bow and submit to you. Or either God says, no, your freedom of choice is gone. Dude, you're bowing. And he shoves everybody down <laughs> yeah. to get him on that knee. I don't see God in that way. Yeah. Um, I believe that, the, the you know, the, there's key scriptures and stuff talking about the kingdom and what you do in the kingdom and what, what is tolerated and what's going to step into it. I think that those are for now. You know, I think that uh, that there's certain consequences to what we would call sin or, um, you know, missing the mark or uh, addictions and the things that are killing you. You know, repent, turn from the things that are killing you, relationships that are killing you, friendships that are killing you, jobs that are killing you, man. Repent, man, like step into the kingdom, you know, so um, I, I, that's how I interpret a lot of that stuff about the judgments and stuff, because we, we pass through that judgment here on earth, man. And um, but, you know, there's just a, there's a lot of um, a lot of it that's just open up in the air for interpretation that we've had it we've had it wrong definitely and it's just when, once you ask those people to take another look at it in these different interpretations of what was really being spoken about it changes everything for me it really helped me the, the hell thing helped on so many levels was because it helped me see how inclusive God was because I knew people whether yeah. they were Hindu whether they were Muslim or whatever or just new agers who uh who produced who 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 bore fruit and the Bible says produce fruit worthy of repentance, you know, meat worthy of repentance that you have to show that you want to change your life. And so I, I, I knew these people who they carried fruit and it was, you know, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, temperance, meekness, self-control, like all of those. And I knew Christians who operated in the fruit of the flesh. You know, they're doing uh, fits of rage and anger, bitterness, envy, jelly, maliciousness, uh, lasciviousness, all of these these things that believers were doing who named the name of Christ. And so and the unbelievers who were walking in fruits of the spirit, um, but they rejected what we called the gospel because they had a bad or a misrepresentation of what it was. They their representation was Fred Phelps. God hates fags. God is, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's who, who they, that was their representation of Jesus. And, um, or their, 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 uh, bitter uncle who was a pastor who was, you know, who disagreed with them or didn't, or didn't like them. And so I really feel like they had a bad representation of the cross of Jesus, of Christianity. And so they rejected it. I don't want that. If that's your Christianity, yeah. take it, take it and shove it in it. And, uh, and so it's our job as believers, uh, as um, ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven to represent Jesus, to represent him to the world because he has been presented mostly 
in the wrong light, in the wrong fashion. And people are saying things that he didn't say. They're representing yep. him to uh, to be some uh, destroyer and there's no grace and no love and he's ready to judge you and hit you over the head with the, the hammer and send you to hell. And so they've had this bad representation of Jesus. And so they respond to that. So is God going to send them to hell for eternity because they had a misrepresentation of who he really is? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I, there's no way that I, I could I could ever um, agree with that, fathom that. So that helped me. And it was for me being around those pe- people as a Christian. I wasn't hanging around those kind of people. I wasn't. Hang- I only hung around Christians. You know, but it was about be, being other people who produced fruit in their life and being able and other. And I would share that with other Christians. And well, that ain't real fruit, brother. That's false fruit. That ain't real. Like, come on, bro. Like, you can't make love, joy, peace, patience. Make, you can't make that up. And that's how Jesus told us to judge. He told us to judge them by their fruits. And that's all I can do. So to think that God would, you know, kick them out or send them to hell man come on man and that really that really was a a big part of my awakening process i will say that the one of the things that probably probably the biggest thing and this is for my wife and i both that uh, let me just say it took us nine months to make the transition because when someone first talked about we call it the restoration of all things and all meaning all you know not trying to uh say well uh you know Anyway, I won't get into that, but because I somebody else you had on the show that was saying something different. It's like all means all. OK. And again, it comes down to the point in the fact that my God is limitless. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that my God, Yahweh, is is not going to say, well, I'm going to restore everything except those things that I can't. OK, what is God sovereign or is he not? <laughs> and, you know. Will he take away our freedom of choice in the process? No. So this isn't universalism, okay? So, you know, some people will say, well, that's universalism. You know, it just means everybody can be saved. And the fact is, yes, everybody can be saved, but it's not universalism because my belief anyway is that they still will have to go through Yeshua. It will be in and through Yeshua that they are saved. But it just means that the love of God in Yeshua will win them over that's what i believe it will win them over not force them but it will win them over and that is the the beauty of the gospel and so people say well if you believe that then there's no reason for evangelism yeah i'm like well you don't understand the love of god because there is more reason for evangelism now that we get out there with the true message what of the true done. Love of god. Yeah. yeah let's get the true message of the love and and what this did for my wife and i when we finally you know came to this realization we went through and we re- re-looked at, you know, all the different scriptures that talk about hell and, you know, and the eternal torment and all this. And it's like, man, you know, again, they chose the words that fit their paradigm. Because when you t- look at the interpretation, especially in Revelation, where it talks about, you know, fire and brimstone, it's like, no, that's a beautiful thing. When you look at what it actually says in the Greek, it's talking about this, you know, refining process that God is yeah. going to refine you and help you achieve that that perfection that is in Christ. And there's just going to be a beautiful thing that's going to come out of that. And yet the interpretation in most English Bibles just slaughters that. Yeah. Just slaughters because they put it in their paradigm. But okay, again, back to what it's done for my wife and I. It has now allowed us, and I just love this, that I can encounter and engage with somebody who's Hindu, who's a Buddhist, who's, uh, you know, Islam, it doesn't matter. And I can love on them and love them knowing that eventually we're all going to be in the same place together. And we're all going to see each other as, you know, for who we truly are, you know, in Christ. And that, um, yeah, it may be a hundred years and, and very likely for many of these people, it may be on the other side of the veil, yeah. but we will all be there and that I can love them and not feel like I have to change them on the spot because that pushes most people away. But now instead I get to engage with them and just love on them. And that's what will change people. I can just love on them. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, and you know, like I know they'll say, well, if you love them, tell them the truth and, you know, (laughs) tell them they're going to hell. They want to hear it. If they're well, if they're ready to hear it. Yeah. But you know, the thing is if they're well ready or willing, it's just going to push them away. Yeah. But let them, like you said, 
experienced the fact that you were walking it out and actually living it and just loving on them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I think on this, this podcast, I've interviewed a lot of different people from all walks of life. And I, I hope I didn't, I think I have given, given, you know, the, the wrong, um, a misconception to a lot of people that I agreed with it. For some reason, they just believe that just having the conversation. I mean, you've got in about having me on and Martin had it. He's in chat. Martin yeah. had me on or was on my show and people, Hey, well, you believe in everything that guy be believes in? Like, what does that even mean? Like, cause I had a conversation with him. Like, so, um, there are, I think that there's a right way and a wrong way to engage in the spirit realm and with different gods and deities and, and, and demons mm -hmm. and angels, there's a right way and a wrong way. So, um, just yeah, to say that, that we love those people and they can have fruit. I do believe in a right way and a wrong way. And so we have to make yeah. sure that we show yeah. the example that we teach the truth in love and, and we bring correction in love and, uh, and things like that too. So, um, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it and it but but to teach that it's in love and it is with the three plumb lines i believe that that's my foundation and um so yeah it's just being open and you'll find you'll find that a lot of those people whether they name the name of christ or not they're looking for the truth and if you're looking for the truth the the truth is found in the person of jesus christ and he is love that became a person and um and and those who are really yeah looking whether they are converted on the other side as some believe or they get converted now man i, I want to be an example and i want to i want to be open and honest and, and live my life to the the best way that i can uh that beckons them to want to be a part of what i got and not trick them yeah. into being saved not win some intellectual battle with them and win them over man but to show them that you know just to bid them to taste and see that the lord is good and he he wants a relationship with them and, and there's nothing that separates you uh, th through that, uh, from that, w through a relationship with Christ because what he did on the cross yeah. for all of us. Yeah, and in, in no way, shape, or form am I trying to advocate that, uh, you know, if you're dealing with somebody and it doesn't mean you need to engage with them where they're at and what they're doing. Um, you know, the, the, you may be showing them a greater level of love by by just engaging with them in love. But when it comes time where they want you to engage with something that you know, that's not something Father wants me to do, that you can just gracefully, graciously bow out and and not condemn them, not judge them, don't have to. But when they're, just by you bowing out says a ton, you know, will say a lot. If you're showing them love, and then at this point you're like, but I'm not going to participate participate with you in that. It doesn't have to be a mean, ugly battle. It's just simply, yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to do that. You know, my, where I'm at, that's not going to be good for me. And, and that ideally, hopefully that would open up another dialogue and they may ask you why. And uh, you may have a more gracious way of saying what I just said that actually opens it up for dialogue. Yeah. so that they can begin to but you they need to be hungry they need to be interested yeah. in what you have because if they're not interested and in you just come up against a wall you're not going to do them any good you're not going to do yourself any good in trying to you know beat them over the head until you've uh, beat them into submission to the gospel <laughs> yeah and i also way. also think the the conversation is a little bit different with believers versus unbelievers too right you know, so there's some believers yeah. who are already in Christ. And even though they do things a little bit differently that are uh, that are, uh, you know, they're still good. Whatever. We don't agree on everything, but they're in Christ. And so um, it, it gets the water gets a little bit muddy because there's unbelievers who I believe are already in Christ because they're walking in love. So I think that that validates them because they bring forth fruit that shows that they're walking in love and the spirit. And yeah. that there's no law against that, against love. Um, but, but there are some corrections on, you know, I think I, I'm going to just gods and, um, uh, uh, just rituals and things like that, that, that I have to be uh, a little bit vocal on, especially now, you know, we have people in our community that I've seen, yeah. um, who was like, Hey, I'm going to try this, you know, I was like, Oh no, don't, you know, could they think that we're <laughs> cool with everything yeah. just cause I interviewed right. somebody that has a different belief or philosophy. But I will say, you know, and I'll just be open and we've talked about this like and I talk about it a lot, like my interaction with you, Karina, even Chris Carter and just seeing like, 
some of the next stagers, um, Martin even, how accepting and inclusive you guys have been for me. You know, what is it, maybe a year and a half, two years now, I don't even know, uh, you know, from our first interactions and how accepting and how you wanted to know my story and you cared about me. That did so much for me and uh, and really has allowed me to be more vocal in my faith and not have to like use other words or use new age terminology. I like the grace that I can because it all means yeah. the same thing. There's a grace there. Yeah. And and I yeah. still have a, a, a mission and, and a mandate upon my life to reach out to the people of which I came from, which was that community. So that's there. But uh, definitely since I've met you guys and, and uh, I've been a lot more outspoken and uh, and getting some things, you know, more on track about my faith and, and the way I operate just because of you guys operating. And there was no no interaction where y'all tried to convert me or even tried to correct me. You know, you guys just sh walked in love and peace and honored me where I was and saw you were able to see me like Jesus saw me, which is huge. And um, yeah. and, it, and just that by itself. You guys, and there was never a correction, never a sitting down. Hey, maybe change some of this. For some, it wanted me. It 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 made me um, just examine myself a little bit more and make sure I was a little bit more clear on my message. Just the own internal work. I don't even know if you guys. I know you meant to do it because it, you're walking in love, and love, you know, does that. And um, so for me lately, I've been doing a lot of shows even the last, you know, two months or so, and it was just a snowball of things and. Um, but I've been doing a lot of shows, having a lot of Christians on my podcast and talking more about Jesus and bringing some correction and bringing some teaching and edification. It was just a natural process that happened. But at the same time, I don't want to, um, what do you call it? Um, self-sabotage and just like really undo the hard work and the things that I've built with this platform to be able to talk to people who disagree, people who from yeah. different backgrounds and stuff like that. But, um, but just the you know you guys it just it's changing it's contagious if i if i can say that contagious to be uh open honest and authentic in every level and uh, and it's allowed me to do that and i know that that's helping other people for me mm -hmm. being authentic about my walk with christ and I'm at the mercy of whatever my guests want to talk about. So if it's a if we're talking about Jesus look i'm going all in if we're talking about the spirit world and ayahuasca look we're going all in we're just I'm, I'm open to the conversation this is what the platform has done but yeah you know commending you guys um for just being yourselves and 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 honoring and it's just done so much well i i appreciate that and and i all i can say is that again the unconditional love of god that finally permeated every cell of my being and i i would even say of the next stagers that are walking in it that that love coming out in unconditional love towards you and toward others i that to me is what will change the world is like we don't we don't you know yes there is a place of judgment for us and so on and so forth but most of our christian judgment has been condemnation <laughs> it's not been a righteous judgment where we're judging people to life no you know we're usually slamming people and trying to kick people while they're down but rather to, to just, uh, you know, be able to, like you said, I actually admire you so much, you know, Derek, because you have got a show where you get to interview all these different people from all these different walks of life, spiritual walks of life, um, and, and you're doing what I would love to be able to do. Uh, I just know that, you know, what God has given to me, you know, ask the Father, yeah. and what he's given to me is a, is a you know, a, a different platform, a different group. But I so honor your platform and your group and your conversations because you're doing some of the deep work that I would so love to do. I would so love to be able to engage yeah. and, and you know, talk to some of those people. I keep asking Father, it's like, hey, you know, right down the street from me are, you know, several psychic, you know, places, you know, come in and get get your palms read, read and all that. And it's like, I just want to go in and sit down and, and talk with them. I just want to love on them yeah. and just, you know, not try to convert them unless they're open. And if they're asking questions, okay, here we go. But yeah. if, if not, I just want to love on them. I want them to see, and I'm not going to be shy about it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I follow Yeshua. Um, and if they know that, and then they see me loving on them, 
that's what's going to cause them to ask questions and be interested. Not if I come in there with the Bible verse and start, you know, throwing stuff out. Shut it down. Know, shut it down. Go to hell. <laughs> this is abomination. <laughs> shut it down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the uh, we got to be uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We got to be tactful in our approach. And that's something that I've I've done. And um, and even becoming all things to all men so that I can win win some that's really become so true for me. And to even have that conversation to the person who's going on an ayahuasca journey. Hey, let's talk to the person who's in steeped in religion and thinks everybody's going to hell and only a few people get into the kingdom. Hey, let's talk. You know what I'm saying? And just like nothing is off the table for us just to have a conversation. If anything, sons of sons and daughters of God should project themselves in those areas, in the, in those arenas so that you can hear it from a biblical or a Christian perspective, if you will, versus like you're looking up this stuff and, uh, and there's no Christians talking about it. You're in trouble, my friend, because the new agers, those there's people who hate God. There's people who hate Christians who hate Jesus and hate pastors. And they're, they will be quick to disciple you and quick to tell you about whatever it is you're Googling at the moment. My goal is that when you Google it, you're going to find a, a believer's take on it. And you don't have to abandon your faith to look outside of your faith. You don't have to abandon your faith to look outside of Christianity as a religion. But you know that that there is a grace there for you to explore as a son and as a daughter and that God has put those uh, desires within your heart to 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 know the truth and to seek after it and to know it and not feel like you have to abandon Jesus or Christianity because that's for some reason that's what we felt. It's like, hey, if you're not with us, you're against us kind of thing. And we we don't want you here if you believe that or we don't want you here if you uh, are listening to that kind of stuff, you know. There's a grace to it, and it's life-changing. It's amazing. Love it. I, I see Martin from the Flying Penguins is on here. He's been making comments, and just, you know, he's another guy that just has a great heart, just open. I mean, he's right right, right in the same vein as we are. And I, I just honor you, Martin, Flying Penguins. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a lot of other people that are on here that are, that are in the same place. And just, mm-hmm. you know, just keep sharing the love. That's what's going to change the world, that we share the love and stop beating people and, um, you know, just, just love on them. Yeah. Love on them. It's little things, even Martin. So like, I don't know the guy and trust me, this is no judgment to the person. So Martin shared the interview cause he came on the podcast and, um, he shared it. And then somebody was like, Hey man, I don't know if you want to be, and you've got it too, right? A lot of people have gotten, this is a you know, part of it, but like, I don't know if he should go on that podcast with true seeker. He's got, he interviews witches or he interviews whatever. And I don't know what you, what they say, but, um, the hey, fact, my honor. It, <laughs> how he, how, how Martin responded to that is, was like a make or break thing for me just to like, you know what I'm saying? Like, even if he didn't know I seen it or whatever the case is. And, uh, and, and it's how you respond, man, that really, you know, we're going to be tested. We're going to be tried. There's gossip, there's backbiting, there's bitterness, there's, you know, all kinds of stuff, but it's really how we respond to that and to, to see how he responded in love <laughs> at the end of the day, how much like just little things like that have an impact on people's lives. And we're our, we're our lives and our walk and our ministry is a, co- a collection of that stuff, you know, and, ha- and us having little impacts on people and they add up. It adds up. People start asking questions and they want to know and they, there's so much darkness, man. There's so much, you know, anger and hostility and right and wrong in the world that people are looking for truth. And as believers uh, in the one true God, I think that we have the answers that they're looking for. So we would never want to yeah. reject them or, or turn them away, but just walk in love. And it's, man, it's contagious. It really is. It is. You know, I love Romans twelve ten. you know, in the uh, English ver- uh, standard translation, I think it is. Uh, or version ESV, uh-huh. uh, it says to outdo one another in honor. And it's just like, man, if, if the world just took that one verse, just that one verse, if the world, everybody just took that one verse and said, let's try to outdo one another in honor. How would that change the world? That would be so, so incredible. Um, I'm getting information on this side saying my internet is unstable. Is it Am I coming through there or is it? It's a little choppy, but I got, I got the alert too. Who knows? We know how this internet is, but you're good though. You're not, you're not breaking up. So the audio is great. 
Adam Starseed Bay says it's yeah, dad, no, Gil Hodges. Okay, I can see that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where I don't see is he on uh, Facebook? Facebook, yeah. Um, you know, and I always reference I don't this see that. anyway. Hey, Adam, good to see you, man. I'm gonna have him on the show. Oh snap! I always reference this uh, interview from. I think Billy, we got a pretty big lag time. Billy Graham and um, Robert Schuler. Did you ever watch that? I know I talk about it a lot. A lot of people have seen. That. Have you seen that short interview? And uh, he talks about uh, the body of Christ and how there's people. Uh, say more. Uh oh. The interview with Billy Graham and Robert Schuler. Have you seen that? Uh, I don't know that I have. Okay. Well, they they uh it it really helped me with uh being more in inclusive and um with it talks about how God has a a people for His namesake all over the world and they may be involved in other religions and it may not even have heard uh the name of jesus but they're part of the body of christ because they're walking in love and they have something within them that just cries out for more for god whatever they know to be god and um but at the end of it he says there's a wideness in god's mercy it's more it's there's it's expansive it's uh it's more inclusive than we've thought mm -hmm. and to to explore that man really is a, i think it's a mystical encounter with the lord all in of itself Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure what the internet's doing here, but uh, I don't know if you want to keep going. I've got other stuff to share, but uh, what would you like to do? Um, we can keep going. You want to try to reconnect? You want to try to jump out and jump back in? See if that helps? Yeah. Yeah, let me try that. All right. Be right back. I'll go through some of these comments here for a few minutes um, just till you come back. Fine Penguin says, love you guys. Um, so people quote my lyrics on here. Um, Shelly says, it definitely takes a certain character type to engage in these ways, but responding in grace and love is for all, for sure. Yeah, you know, a lot, And I, but I will say there's a lot of people um, who look at what we do as something like extraordinary, extraordinary, that it takes a certain type to. <laughs> to 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 engage in love and things like that but that's for all too it's like oh man god has called you to such a thing and um it's not for everybody but i think i think evangelism is for everybody now what type of people group or whatever that you know you're called to that's i think that's uh on an individual basis um clint says uh in a spiritual way i like to help people see the truth that's why i love your motivation derek I learned a lot from your songs. Thank you, man. Yeah, the podcast, I try to articulate some of the stuff that's in the songs, right? And knowing how deep and much how much information go into those songs. And I know that a lot of people know who I am and listen to this podcast because of the music. It's so weird because I don't even really promote the music too much anymore. I, it's just out there and just like I just hope that people find it, you know, and, um, and resonate with it. And um, so... I mean, I still, I still make it. It's just uh, there's a lot of people know who who I am and what I do because of the music, and there's a lot of people who don't know the music. They know who I am because of the podcast, and and they don't know anything about the music. So, which is interesting. I like to kind of marry the two together. Uh oh, he says he's in the waiting room. Thanks for Zoom. Just wanted to automatically update and do this waiting room stuff, man. I don't know why. Okay, you look better. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, I feel better. You bet. It's better. I do. Hear, I do hear a little. Okay, you're watching me on another video, right? Yeah. That's yeah. what it was. Okay. Shut off. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm just gonna go through some of these comments right here. Um, Adam says, uh, "Yes, we have to unite somehow. The body of Christ needs to unite somehow. Real talk. Love will unite us, but we have to live in love." And love and mature within the love. Amen. There's different layers yeah, to yeah. it, man. You know. 
Yep, yep, yep. Definitely, definitely. S. Oliver says Mystic Mind. Well, like I said, I've songs. got, you know, some of the things we haven't talked about is uh, we still lagging? Apparently we still have some lag time. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You start it, and we'll just have to keep that in mind that there's going to be a few seconds of delay, and we'll just try to give okay. those seconds. Well, just, you know, a few of the things. I'm going to switch gears again here, but um, I just love the limitlessness of God because now these are my own experiences. So if, if you're not a heaven walker, man, I just encourage you to, to begin that process. So, you know, Dean and I have the course called Ultimate Impact that basically teaches people to begin engaging Father in the heavens. Um, it is so, so powerful to me. It is more real than this world that we're living in right now. Um, and in that process, you will, your frequency is going to change. You're going to begin to be, uh, you're going to absorb the frequency of heaven and, and that love, and it's going to begin changing you. Uh, and so anyway, I just encourage that. So one of the things, though, that we do say is do not take your experiences and try to make them into a doctrine. In other words, I cannot take my experience and try to superimpose it onto you. That would not be good. That would be wrong because uh, God may be leading you in a different path. And as someone said, I saw in the chat earlier, as well as, um, uh, you know, in Scripture, it says that there, there's coming a time, and I believe we're already stepping into it, that all will be taught of the Lord. So if you have an intimate relationship with the Father, He's going to be taking you down the road that you need to go with Him. And that it would be wrong for me or anyone else to try to take my experience or my belief and try to superimpose it onto you and tell you that you have to do you have to do this this way, or you have to experience it this way. Because there are a lot of people out there trying to teach that you got to go through all these different protocols to step into the heavens. And if you don't do it right, that you're going to get kicked out. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that sounds like the <laughs> salvation according to works again. <laughs> yep. But I, just go ahead. No, I would say I, I want to, I just echo that. And, um, you know, I, and I've thought about that because I've been, I've told that, and you have to receive a mandate to bring people into the heavens. But, my mind just goes straight to the scriptures. Spirit and bride say, come. He says, come. Yes. Let all, let, just come. I've got great and mighty things to show you and have an encounter for these people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so so these are my experiences. You can take them or leave them, but they resonated with me, and I, I really love what he shared with me. But in my process of trying to understand God, which we all kind of do that, we want to understand Father, We un we, but part of the reason that, at least myself, and I think many people want to understand God is so that we can, if we, if we think we can understand him, then we can kind of get him in that box where we feel comfortable and can control him, and so to speak. And it's like, man, we've got to let go of that because God is so far beyond that. He is limitless. And that we, as we're stepping into this next stage, we have to come to a place where we become comfortable with the uncertainty of the mysteries of God. Because he's going to want to just bring, he's bringing himself uh, to us in, in ways that are so far beyond what he's done in the past. That if we keep wanting to try to understand him before we can move to the next place or whatever, we're going to miss out on so much. So just coming to the place where we are uh, comfortable with the uncertainty and step into the mysteries of God with him and go through the experience. We don't have to try to figure it out. We don't have to try to um, understand it so that we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, again, put it in a box so that we feel comfortable or, or put so, it in a book. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You know and that, and again, putting it in a book and saying, well, this is the way you got to do it. It's like, Oh my yeah. goodness. This, please, is, this is the way we did it. Sounds better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so here's what I experienced is what, at one of my points where I was trying to understand God and, and it's like, you know, there are some people in the earth realm that will say there's 11 dimensions. And then there's some that'll say there are 63 different dimensions. Some will say there's 365 different dimensions. And I'm like, wait a minute. If God is God and he's sovereign and he's limitless, I think he can have as many dimensions as he wants. And I'm trying to fathom this and understand it. And I'm having a conversation with Father in the heavens. And he says, yeah, there are unlimited dimensions and there are unlimited realms and he's and I'm thinking, OK, at least I got that. I got there's unlimited dimensions. There's unlimited realms. OK. And then he says, 
And then there's unlimited words and things that you do not even have words for yet that are still unlimited. It's like the unlimitedness goes beyond unlimited. You know, it's just infinite. I, it's kind of like Buzz Lightyear. It's to infinity and beyond. It just keeps going and going. This is our God. You know, and I'm like, wow, he's really exposing to me his limitlessness. And and there's still, you know, parts of me that are trying to figure out little pieces of God, like, you know, why, you know, what's hell? <laughs> you know, and, and things like that when he's wanting to help us understand he is limitless and he loves us unconditionally with that limitless love. Amen. Um, I think that God is willing to take us as deep as our faith will allow and our, 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 our belief will allow. And even if that belief is just a kickstarter to take you deeper, to show you things that you never fathom, but uh, having that, that, that grid, that, that more is possible, that all things are possible for them that believe the all things, nobody can tell you what that, what those all things are, you know, cause there's things that we've already seen and been, been, been privy to that, uh, you know, we'd had no grid for, you know, and, and nobody believes, but there's just way more, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, just having yeah. a heart to understand yeah. how those realms operate, you know, and it's a bit different now. I've, I've, I've you know, I, I have fun just engaging now, but there was a, there was a time when all my learning and awakening was going on that I was just like, man, all this was brand new. And when something's new for you, man, yeah. you know, um, I was stargazing and, you know, seeing angels and all kinds of just far beings and stuff every day. It's I, I engage differently now. I'm not outside till three in the morning every night anymore. There was a point where I was, you know, and uh, well, but uh, as long as you can have the grid. And so there's things that build that grid for you. There's uh, conversations like these to uh, to hear mm -hmm. testimony and what what is possible what god did for for gill and visions and stuff that he is uh also uh willing and open to do for anybody else who will seek him in that way and so that's why testimonies i think are important that it, it's building people's faith to go out and try it and uh and even to to resonate with people again who may feel margin maybe feel marginalized because they've had some type of supernatural encounter, but there is no Christian grid for it, you know, or, or just grid yeah. in general. Um, so it, it's really helping people when we talk about these experiences and encounters, because if you can believe it, you can receive it, you know, and a lot of what we've been, we've, we've been told faith works that if I can see it, I can believe it, show me and I'll believe it. But it's like, listen, if you can fathom it, if you can dream it up, you can encounter it. And that's just, there's not, there is no <laughs> limit to uh the depths of god's love and that's the uh the love is what fuels the faith you know um and yeah. it's a love for him a love for creation um to, to know how it works the spirit realm the spirits mm -hmm. the angels and so that for me has been a vehicle like the the you know the love is the fuel that fuels the faith which is the vehicle and the scripture says that you know um yeah I've seen crazy far out stuff and I know that there's more, but I uh, just, and, you know, trying to articulate right. that and how it, uh, how we can share it with people in a practical way and how we change lives, you know? And I think that's one of the things that we, you know, have to come to uh, grips with is that um, there's always more, uh, you know, when I was in my pastorate back in the nineties, I, I thought that I had all the truth and all that, you know, and then I came out of that and moved into things of the spirit. And uh, my wife and I were thinking, oh, wow, this is it. But then we moved into a greater level. And anyway, just it just kind of kept leveling up, kept leveling up. And each time we're thinking, oh, man, this is it. We finally arrived. And finally, we're at a point of realizing, again, God is limitless. And, the, and, and there is an infinity of different levels that he will take us into. And so now I'm just like, I'm going to enjoy each level that he has me on. He has me on a level right now and I'm enjoying it. And um, I'm not putting limits on it and just waiting for the next, not, not looking for it because I want to be in the moment and enjoy what he's got me in right now. But just knowing that, and there's a next mm -hmm. and there's a next. And that's why we call it next stagers versus uh, uh, the, what does some people call it? Um, the, 
final age or something. I, I can't remember what the, what they were calling it. Um, but it, the thing is, it is a next age. It's not, it's not even the, the, the last age, you know, father has so much more for us. We're just stepping into the next age where again, I believe he's leveling up humanity to start walking in the spirit in ways that we never have before becoming those mature sons that the Bible talks about that creation is waiting for. Mm. Amen. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about, because I'm, I'm probably bigger on the uh, solo stuff than I am on the group stuff, but both are needed and I enjoy both. And I, I feel like uh, you guys are really big on group ascensions. Um, where does, yeah. um, how important is it? For us, I feel like you go by yourself, and then when, and as long as you're going in, you got revelation, you know how to navigate. The Lord's de- imparted something in your spirit, and then when we come together collectively, that even turns into a vehicle for us to ascend into His presence mm-hmm. and into the heavenly realms. How important is it uh, to to do this daily by yourself versus week to week with a group, or you know, in in religious terms, sun, from Sunday to Sunday, but you don't do it at home, you don't worship at home. You don't, you know, spend time in the Father's presence. Um, is it is it even important to do it by yourself? I feel like it is. I, yeah, I think it's uh, more important. <laughs> it, it's key. I mean, that without that, I mean, that's your that's your intimate time with the Father. That's, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about going to the Garden of the Heart, going to your garden, the Garden of your heart, with the Father or with Holy Spirit or with Yeshua. And it's just intimate time. And that is where I believe we are changed. And the reason I believe it is because that's where I was changed. Now, that may not be the same case for everybody, but I am so changed and raptured (laughs) when I'm in that place in the garden with the Father. Now, sometimes they'll take me out of the garden and we'll go on some spectacular trips and, you know, experience some crazy, wonderful stuff. But it's with him or it's with Yeshua or it's with Holy Spirit. And and sometimes there's some, some other hosts of heaven that, you know, will we'll take me on journeys, but it's that encounter in the heavens that changes me and how I'm being changed is I am being expanded in my love and I'm being expanded in, you know, just my, my understanding of, of him. And again, it's limitless. This, so we're never going to run out of it. But to me that if you had to choose between group or single, absolutely go for the single, because again, that's your personal encounter with the father. Now, moving over to the groups, though, I love the group encounters because something that Father kind of showed me was that, you know, you are a gate and you are a portal into the heavens, into the kingdom. You yourself are, you know, because, you know, Holy Spirit lives in you and it's through Yeshua. He lives in you. Yahweh lives in you. In you, you are a gate into the kingdom. And so we let our light shine because the kingdom is shining into us you know, from the kingdom into this realm. And that's how we let our light shine. But you are a gate, you are a portal. And that when you and I get together, you know, it's one portal and now it's you, two portals. But this is what Father showed me. If we bring in a third person, it goes exponentially. It goes to four portals and then eight and then 16. It's just the magnification. So that's why so many people will say it's so hard for them to do it on an individual basis, but they can do it in a group. So the group may be important for some people to kind of get started, you know, because they struggle to do it on their own. But going into a group, that's why it is easier as far as, you know, my understanding is that it's easier because that group dynamic, you know, opens up a wider portal and it's so much easier to engage. Now, the beauty of it that I love when we engage as a group is everybody in the group that is in that in that group. They're there for a purpose. And what Father begins to do, and I, I just love this because it, it has never failed. Uh, I take that back one time because actually some people were actually didn't know. They weren't engaging with Father. They were just throwing out their own stuff. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. and I'm just like, this isn't going yeah. anywhere. Yeah. But when people are receiving from the Father, it's just beautiful because it creates a mosaic. Each person has a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And when they share their piece of the puzzle that mosaic begins to take form. And before we're done with the group ascension, we see this beautiful picture, which is the message that the father is wanting to give mm-hmm. to that group for that time. Yeah. And it's just phenomenal. Yeah. I've been, it. I've been a part of those with you guys and uh, they're, they're definitely beautiful. But then again, I've tried to um, do some with, you know, whether it was unbelievers or people who just weren't at that level and then you get other 
huh? I'm not, you know. Yeah. Um, but when it's <laughs> when it's one, I mean, you got some. You got to teach people. They've never done it. You know what I'm saying? They don't know right. what it is. So right. yeah, there is a new. Uh, you know, God is still inclusive when it's that, and it's like trying to block people yes. out, or you can't step into the heavens because you're not a Christian or whatever. Again. Spirit and bride say, come, man. He's willing to reveal himself yeah. to you. And yeah. even with my meditation, my, my throne room, when like the testimonies and stuff that, that I'm getting back and a lot of them from people who aren't what we would call a Christian or whatever, like, then they're just having these encounters with the Lord in, in the throne room. And it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, it blows me away. So, um, uh, we just gotta, you know, we, we have the ability to change the atmosphere and for people to step into that. Yes. Um, this is, this is something yeah. interesting. We can kind of go there. Um, Adam Starcy wants to know, have to ask, he says, why does Gil choose to say, uh, Yeshua instead of Jesus? <laughs> it trigger, I mean, uh, it, it triggers people. Yeah. For some people it might, um, I just have come to realize, well, how do I, I want to say it carefully, but my understanding is Yeshua is his Hebrew name. And the Hebrew scholars that I've spoken with, uh, that's the name that they have. That's the name I most hear is Yesh mm -hmm. Yeshua. Um, and then, um, you know, same with Yahweh. Now, there are, I know there's been documentation coming out that's kind of new, new, new revelation, but it's coming from, you know, solid evidence that perhaps it's not Yahweh, but it is Yehovah. Um, and the thing is, does God get hung up on it? If you don't say the right words, are you going to be kicked out? No, not at all. So it really is preference. I, I just feel like that is Yeshua's name. I mean, the way I, this will trip a few people, I think. But when I'm engaging with the, the, the Trinity, I Father is Yahweh, but I call him Father because that is more intimate for me. Uh, Yeshua is Yeshua, and Holy Spirit is Ima. And this is where people might get tripped up. But Ima is Hebrew for mother. And if you do look in the Hebrew, Ruach is a feminine word. Uh, and, you know, as on earth as it is in heaven, it's like if there's not a mother and a father and a child in heaven, then why do we have mother, father, child in the earth if the earth is a reflection of heaven? And so, you know, it's like Chris Carter, he, he uses a term that's kind of funny. It's like uh, it, it makes more sense that Holy Spirit would be mother than otherwise you've got you've got father son and strange uncle or father son and dove <laughs> you know <laughs> you know it's like wait a minute okay so the lgbt may be right then mm -hmm. and uh, yeah no i don't believe that but you know but the, it gives credence to it when we give this male dominant godhead as the figure for what is supposed to be reflected in the earth it makes to me it makes a whole lot more sense that that um holy spirit would be feminine and again, in the Hebrew, Ruach is feminine. You get to the Greek, it's kind of neuter. I was actually just, I just did an interview with uh, Brian Simmons yesterday. And he confirmed that even in the Greek, I guess, that it can be feminine. And uh, uh, so anyway, you get to Latin, Latin totally changes it to, to, to male. And so again, you're looking at a male dominant society who is now taking and, and redoing the scriptures and all of a sudden Holy Spirit becomes male. It didn't used to be that way. Shekinah, I think, is another um, Shekinah glory. You know, that was something that we used a lot. Shekinah, if I understand correctly, is also feminine. So there's a great deal of information that would indicate that Holy Spirit would be the feminine side of the Godhead. Uh, am I going to argue that and, you know, beat people over the head with it? No. If people aren't interested in hearing that and don't want to know it, that's fine. <laughs> but that's my re Yahweh, Yeshua, and Ima. Yeah, there is no father Mom. without the mother. So, for sure. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. I mean, that's it. I use all of them. I use all of them. I, yeah. I find myself uh, sometimes calling them uh, Yesu. That's a name that comes out, Yesu. Uh, and I know that's like yeah. from uh, kind of a derivative of the Isa <clears throat> a little bit that's in the, uh, um, you know, before we had the, the J's for Jesus or, you know what I'm saying, Yesu. Um, but I use all of them. I use Jesus. I use uh, Yeshua, Yeshaya, which is a, a really uh, intimate name for me, Yeshaya. Um, or yeah. if you want to well, break it down to Yashaya. Um, and God for me, he, a, lot, a lot of people say Yahweh, and I, I, I use I use all of them, man. I use Yahweh. I use uh, one of the closer ones for me is uh, um, Ahaya. 
Ahaya, mm-hmm. uh, meaning I am that I am. So, and he, and basically yeah. I am that I am and I will be whatsoever I will be transforms into God to be whatever you need for that moment, man, for that situation, exactly. for that season. I'm going to be that God. I'm going to be that strong tower. I'm going to be that provider. I'm going to be that warring uh, father that you need. I'm going to speak up for you in this season, you know, and that's, I, I'm going to show up for you as that. Absolutely. And that, that's the thing. If God were that concerned that you got his name right, then why would he give you so many different ways to name him or call him? You know, the names of God in the Bible are just there. And like you just stated, they're usually uh, giving us uh, an indication of what is needed in that season. And I'll just go off the radar here for a minute and just say that in my encounters in the heavens, when I, you know, go into the heavens, uh, there was a season where, you know, I was going in and having communion with, with uh, Jesus, Yeshua, you know, every day, multiple times, and, and we'd have communion in the spirit. Um, and all of a sudden, for some reason, Yeshua started to appear to me, and he looked like Bob Marley. And people were like, what? What in the world? You are so off your rocker. But here's the thing. I was in a season where I was, you know, engaged. I mean, I had a lot of things going on. I was, uh, you know, battling some stress. And so here comes Bob Marley, who, in my mind and in my understanding, you know, here's a guy, Jamaica, just, and it's not Bob Marley. He's not Bob Marley, but, you know, it's just somebody <laughs> that looks like Bob Marley. The image, you know, a it's the image me. of this laid back, yeah. chill person, just, yeah. just chill. And that was the message to me. For like six months, he appeared to me looking like Bob Marley. And it just, the message was chill, relax. And that is, again, like you, you were saying, is, you know, the different names of God represent different aspects of his character that he brings and it's what we need for that time. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm with it. Um, uh, the, the name is the character. The name is, uh, is not the pronunciation. You're calling upon the character and all who, those who call That's upon good. the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in some of these weird sacred name groups, you know, if you don't have the right name, then you're calling upon a demon or you're calling I remember being a. I remember getting so far into some of that theology when people started saying that. I was like, "Oh man, I gotta check out, bro." And then seeing what it did to my own life and my wife, for real, my wife, she didn't. She, it would hinder her from praying because she didn't know what name to use. Couldn't say Jesus because we're calling on Zeus. Couldn't say even with the whole, you know, what I'm saying uh, Yeshua and Yahshua. There's a whole debate on who's which is the right one. And man, look. You're causing these little ones to stumble, man. It's really simple. You know what I'm saying? You're calling upon a spirit. You're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And uh, he responds to the name Jesus. He responds yes. to the name Yeshua, Yahshua, Ahaya, Yahweh, the, the creator of heaven and earth. And he responds to yeah. those names for sure. Yeah. Well, it is clear, I think, in Romans chapter 1 that there are some who never call on the name of Jesus. And um, and yet they encounter the, the the frequency or the love when they look into nature and they just know that there's a God and they submit to that. Didn't need any name at all. And they just simply engage with that. And, and so, I mean, here's the thing is, is we are saved through Yeshua, period. OK. And or Jesus. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, if it, if if whatever you're talking about, whatever you're thinking about involves being saved through Yeshua and, or Yeshua plus this, forget it. That's not what the scriptures are saying. We are saved through God alone, through Yeshua, uh, Jesus. And, and, and uh, what, what I'm seeing a lot of today, especially in the heavenly realm, is there is a lot of stuff coming out to where it seems like the bar to get in keeps getting raised. It's like it's Yeshua plus you got to do this right plus this plus this plus this and I'm like no and I, I love it because I, I laughed but Jesus uh, showed me a picture and he said and it's like you know a high bar that you got to jump over you know yeah. instead it was it was sitting on the ground he says yeah people are tripping into the kingdom you don't have to jump the bar he says you just got to get to it and you'll fall over in fact you don't yeah. even have to get to it the bar will come to you. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I, I, you know, I, I, there's a couple, there's a few things that I look out for and it's usually the, um, the people who own exclusivity to things or we came up with it or man, this stuff is ancient, bro. To to think that like it came out with this one teacher who made it popular or put some, some names and terms out there that we're all using it. you like, man, that when we look back in history, that's the interesting thing is the fact that 
Like we feel like we're coming into a lot of new stuff. Man, this stuff is old. They've been doing this. They've been traveling <laughs> the heavens. They've been, you know, leaving their body. They've been encountering angels. Like in there's texts that were taken out. You ain't even got to go to them. Just st- st- stick to the, the 66. If you really dig, man, you find some crazy out of this world encounters within that within the scriptures, man, that give you a plumb line or a frame of reference or a grid for some of these experiences. And to act like you own any of them, that's where I, I, I begin to ask questions myself and see like people are holding on to, I call them the gatekeepers, you know, and then when you bring other people in, <clears throat> um, they try to hold on to it or sell it, or you gotta, you have to do it this way. And uh, that's when I ask questions myself you know, or, or I don't know about calling people out, but I do. It it draws a red flag for me. Oh, they're doing it wrong. This is the only way we've been. We were given this mandate in '97, and I put out a book on it. And if you do it uh, other than this, and you're not doing it right, it's like, come on, dude. Nope, lost it. And see, to me, that goes back to the indication of uh, that that type of thought process is wrapped up in I have to be right. Yeah. And. Where does that come from? It comes from an insecurity. Where does that come from? Not loving yourself. And, you know, so it all comes back down to spend the time with Yeshua, Yahweh, God. Spend the time with him so that his love for you permeates you so deeply that you are in love with yourself as much as he is. And um, that will change a lot of things just right there. I think that's what why that stands out to me because that's where I came from and similarly to you it's the same type of spirit that of the more people that we can convince to believe this way validates something that we just may not really believe ourselves you know and that definitely comes from the whole debating thing and trying to convince people and even in the whole spiritual free hippie Christian movement there's a lot of that still going on so you know that in it and we can identify it because we used to operate out of it so yeah yeah, that's good. We know the harm that it can do, so I'll say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's been good. Well, um, let's go ahead and plug plug some of your stuff, man. The ultimate impact that you got going on, and and uh, Kingdom Talks, which uh, uh, you know, the talk shows and and interviews that that you're doing as well, so people can get involved and check that stuff out too. Yeah, yeah. So kingdomtalksmedia.com, you can pretty much find everything there. We've got what we call the easy buttons. Uh, Try to make it as easy to get to the things that we think are important on the website as possible. But uh, one of them is the KT communities. That's actually free. So everybody that's kind of, not everybody, but people that are walking in this movement, we invite them to come. It's free. Uh, There's different groups with different, it's kind of like a social media thing, but you don't have to worry about getting kicked off. And we talk about all kinds of stuff there. Uh, You're welcome to it. Then um, there is uh, the um, ultimate impact, which we were just talking about. That to me, you know, Adina, my wife and I, uh, we have said many, many times over and over that uh, if we had to let go of everything and we could only keep one thing, it would be the ultimate impact. Because for me, the ultimate impact, it is helping people, what I call crossover, crossover from the church age into the kingdom age. It's helping them learn how to step into the heavens. It's helping them to understand who they truly are. You know, I believe the ecclesia, the government of God, is going to be so critical in this age to come that we need to understand who we are, that we are the government of God, but we're not to govern on our own. Jesus didn't do anything unless he went to see what the Father was doing. So we teach you how to step into the heavens to see what the Father is doing So that you're doing that because so often good Christians, good intentional, you know, good Christians with good intentions um, are so often praying against or actually combating what God's actually doing. And and when we go into the heavens, it's like we get an education really quickly, find out that Father's doing something different where, you know, we thought we needed to be doing this because we're good Christians. We've been Christians for 30, 40, 50 years that we know what to do. Well, we go to the heavens and find out Father's doing something different. And that we want to cooperate with what he's doing. We have seen that probably 80, 90 percent of all the issues that we do deal with in the physical realm. If we deal with them in the spiritual realm first, they will take care of themselves and we don't have to do much of anything. But then there's times where God does want us to do something in the physical realm. And so we'll we'll do that. But it's just an incredible change to go from church in a box to the open church in the heavens where we are all engaging uh, and, and Jerry, this is cool because we've been um, actually getting our groups to start practicing, engaging in the heavens with one another outside of our group time. So in other words, 
this is an assignment that I gave people and we're starting to do it. And it has just been absolutely mind blowing. But go to, you know, in our groups, we, we tell everybody, go to each person in the group during the week in the spirit and give them a gift in the spirit. And then each person then therefore is going to also go in and receive a gift from each person. Write it down, write what you give, and then also write what you receive. And I can tell you that the very first uh, indications of this that just, I mean, it just, I'll just say it's freaking crazy. <laughs> it's really good um, because somebody gave me a very specific uh, toolbox. It, they described it. And the thing is, they had no clue of this. That they described to me the the toolbox that is in my heart that was my father's toolbox in the when i was a kid and and that they described that very toolbox to me and i'm just blown away anyway it's just if you tried it in the past and it didn't work again we're stepping into a whole new age a whole new era and as we're stepping into this father is releasing new spiritual technologies that are allowing us to step into it might not have been ready for it before. I mean, there and there were people that were doing this, but now it's for everybody. Yeah. We're stepping into the age. It's for everybody. You can step into the heavens. And here's one other thing. Do not get caught up on the idea that you have to see or that you have to hear. You have to feel. You have to smell. You have to taste. Those are all five senses of this physical body. Don't limit yourself to that in the heavens. It is unlimited in the ways that God can communicate with you when you step into the heavens. You may receive stuff and you may just not have language for it. And that's okay. That alone, being in the heavens, is going to change your frequency. It's going to change you into a more loving person. And you're just going to, it's, it's going to be incredible. So there you go. That was my soapbox. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Yeah, I'm with it. And uh, you're <laughs> stepping into the next age. And I really like, um, I really like a lot of the, um, um, the NLP people um, who are really like showing the science behind the spirituality, you know, what's going on in the brain when yeah. you do something like this and creating the new neural pathways and changing uh, your, uh, how you respond to an experience that you had and, uh, you know, removing thoughts and replacing them with thoughts of love. And I really, for, yeah. for, for th th that's a thing of love to step in and do that. And Jesus is love. And he, he's able to step into our past, present and future and move things around and shift things. And I really think that that's what happens when we step into uh, the heavens or step in even into worship, you know, um, d different levels of worship. You know, I think that's how yeah. I enter in. Yeah. Usually it's through just worship, worship, getting into the gates through praise and thanksgiving and stepping into the courts. And so um, it's beautiful. And, the spirit and bride say, come, he bids, he bids us all to come. He's looking for people who want to come, who want to hang out. And I've always yeah. had that image that God's just like, man, who wants to hang out? And it's just like, Hey, I, I'll, I'll hang out with you, you know, and shut the door. When you pray, go into your prayer closet and spend time with the creator of the universe. And he'll show you Jeremiah 33, three, uh, great mighty things that you do not know and cannot find out any other way except going to him, spending time in his presence. Gil. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on, hanging out with me. You know we'll do it again. Love you. Everything you got going on, brother. Thanks so much for everything you do. Love it. Love you. Love your people. Blessings. Shalom, shalom. Peace. Take care. Gil Hodges, ladies and gentlemen, with Kingdom Talks. Kingdom Talks. Good brother. Got to meet him. Uh, most of you have probably seen the, the image of this uh, this interview, and I uh, got to meet him a couple months ago, and uh, he did a... Uh, retreat not a retreat he did a conference in uh mississippi and that's pretty close to my neck of the woods uh actually it was about four or five hours away but um four hours away probably and went up there to, to meet him for the first time and man he was so welcoming him and his wife adina and really loved those guys and vouched for what they're doing walking in love and walking in the spirit and peace and unity man come on it's contagious and uh what they're doing is going to blow up what they're doing is catching on because it's love there's no law against it. It's good stuff. Um, so, yeah, man, thank you guys for hanging out with me. Um, interesting, too, uh, I want to one of these comments a while ago, um, the Gothic mystic Joshua says that um, through prayer you were getting some some names of God or some, some uh, interpretations of some things that you were speaking in tongues and beginning to interpret them. I thought that was really interesting, some of the stuff that you were saying 
through tongues and prayer that you interpreted. Um, I've definitely been doing that. And um, it's really interesting, some of the, the words and stuff that come through when you write them down or you look them up on uh, Google Translate. I remember I did that years ago and some of the messages that come through. And I do that in some of my sessions when we do one-on-one sessions with people. I will go in and I go in really deep and we just connect in the spirit. And uh, I go in and get messages that come out in tongues and I write them down for people. Um, and we try to interpret them and, and, uh, some really interesting stuff comes out. So it's really cool. There's some, um, remember I did, we did some breath work two weeks ago and, um, I just went into this thing where like I go, I, when I get into really deep levels, um, there's a lot of chanting that comes up out of me and I just kind of, the Holy spirit just speaks through me and begin chanting some stuff and wrote those words down. There were syllables and and wrote them down and it was a it was a praise that came out of me i looked it up what it meant in hebrew and uh there was some some hebraic uh, praises that came out and i wrote them down and you know want to uh maybe put them to some music or something like that man something that we can kind of enter into i really believe what's cool about these uh, uh experiences and and ways that we engaged in in them that they create a portal and a doorway as well for us to enter back in through it like we've we've been into this dimension we've been into this portal we know what it what it brings with it we know how to get back to it so that once we go there in the secret place by ourselves i believe we can take people with us years ago in the early 2000s there was a a mother and a son who would come and minister and they would travel and they i remember she said uh they pretty much just recreate their living room experience. So her and her son would just enter into God's presence and they would be shown great and mighty things and have these beautiful out of, out of the, this world experiences with the Holy spirit. And, uh, and then when they would travel and go to different churches to minister, they just say, Hey, we're just recreating what we, we do in the living room and we're just going to allow you guys to come with us. And so I remember that just being this, this, uh, almost an entry point to be able to recreate encounters and take people with us. And what I do on, on my guided meditations is I go in with the father and I have an encounter and then, but it's really interesting because I'm in the encounter and I'm writing it down as I'm what I'm seeing. And I'll ask the father something and he'll translate it to me. And, uh, and I'll be, I'll see pictures and what I'm seeing and stuff and write it down. And then I recreate it and it's working. Like people are going in, and having these encounters in the spirit for themselves and going into the throne room of God. And it's just this formula of what worked for me, at least in that season. And um, it's a it's a path to the Father's heart. It's a portal, you know, and, I, and, and when we can create that, when we can articulate that, where others can get back to the Father's heart that way. It's like leaving breadcrumbs. I'm going in. I don't know how to get back. And I'm going to leave these breadcrumbs and I'm going to follow them back or, or other people can follow me in. And so I, I've done that with those guided meditations. I think that every time that we go in, in the spirit, I trust and believe that even if it's something new, you know, where Gil was talking about doing some of the ascensions for the first time, we can take people with us if we're leading it, that other people can go. So I'm trusting that people are following me and, uh, and definitely help. It helps. And uh, you look and people are having their own encounters, no matter where they are, we do that. Uh, with people all over the world, which is really cool. Um, and uh, just to to read the the the, uh, the testimonies of people who are going in encountering the Father, I uh, I wanted to show a friend of mine um, after the interview the other day. It was um, Daniel Lovett. I wanted to show him some of the throne room encounter um, meditation because I was describing to him, but I said, let me just let you hear it. So I I let him hear some of the encounter the guided meditation and there's voice actors there's sound effects it's not just me doing a guided meditation it's it's in immersive um so i let him hear it and then we're we're talking over zoom <clears throat> he closes his eyes and he kind of goes into it so i was like all right let me I, I wasn't planning on playing the whole thing just the clip so he closes his eyes and he goes into it i was like well let me close my, close my eyes and go into it and i close my eyes and uh just and I know what's coming up. I know everything. Like I wrote it, I edited it. You know, it's a lot of work, but still, I close my eyes and I go into it, and I just begin to weep, man. I'm taken into the throne room of God. I think there's a piece of me that's an expectancy for that person, 
knowing the power of creating that portal that's going to lead them to an encounter with the living God. Like all of that's kind of playing in my mind, just creating this beautiful experience. And I'm just in the throne room myself and I close my eyes and I'm taken immediately to that place. And it's beautiful. And I know that we have the power to do that, to recreate that. See, there's other things that we create that are portals as well that are that lead them to other places outside of the heart of God. You create gossip, you create backbiting, you create envy, murmurs, all of these things, and it leads them somewhere else. It's a portal. If they follow your gossip, if they follow your bitterness, they're going to end up somewhere else. It's a portal that's a means to an end. So us as being created in the image and likeness of a creator, God, we have the power to create. So all of our art, people are talking about my music here. Shout out to you guys. Um, my music is a portal. It's a means to an end. It's an encounter. It's a journey. It unlocks things within you. There's prayers. There's mantras. There's all types of things embedded within that audio. And so it creates a, a, an encounter for you as well. So the meditations, the music, everything that I create, my book is a portal. Like anything that I'm creating, I understand that it has the power to bring you to a new place spiritually, unlock some things in you that uh, that I, that is a responsibility that I have, whether we're creating anything else. There's so much other things that we're creating that is demonic, is out of bitterness and envy, and it's going to lead people down a road of bitterness and envy if it catches on and if it takes root. So with that being said, understand that you the, you have the power of life and death was within in the tongue. We have the power and the ability to create experiences for ourselves and for others. And so anything that we create, anything that we do, that we, we give a account of everything that comes out of our mouth, out of our mind, out of our imagination, it returns back to you. You know, I feel like when I go into the presence of God and I and I receive waves of his mercy, I receive waves of his grace. That's that's my I, I reap what I sow. I'm creating encounter for people to go in and say, when I go in, look, I need it myself. I need another wave of your grace. I need another uh, drink from your fountain of life. And so because I've been faithful to kind of keep doing that and, and creating uh, realms where other people can go in and encounter God. It just builds it for me and for you. And this is a testimony. I'm not pulling you to my own horn. This is for you too. What you're creating, storing up treasures in heaven. It comes back to you. Press down, shaking together and running over, man. The more that you give, the more that you receive. And it's just a law. You know, you ain't even got to, you don't even have to expect to receive. Just let it come out of you, flowing, open and honest. Let it flow, man. So uh, whatever you're creating, man, be mindful, be tactful, wise as serpents. A serpent is cunning, wise, wisdom. You got one right up on you. You ain't even seen it. it snuck up on you. <laughs> wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. That's how we're supposed to be in this realm. Thank you guys for hanging out. <clears throat> Again, if you want to support my work, head on over to my Patreon. It unlocks so much really cool stuff. It's a membership site. You get access to different things at different levels and different tiers, the meditations. I got a couple new, um, even with the meditations, there's some prayers that I'm doing. So like prayers against anxiety, prayers against fears, and like th they are meditations in and of themselves. They're, they're, they have meditation music and they're looped. So you can close your eyes and really just kind of go in uh, to that. Um, those experiences so some of those are, are being uploaded to just a little cool downloads for you to experience and they're powerful um affirmations uh, bible scriptures that you know um faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so when you put on a meditation like that that's only the scriptures there's meditations that are only the scriptures being spoken over you that are about spiritual warfare or about abundance or about um healing or whatever it, uh, it builds your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So being able to create that experience for you and tap into it, man, it'll change your life. It will unlock some things within you as well. So uh, thank you guys for hanging out. Check out everything that we have at the table. That I have so much that I'm bringing that it's just even hard to mention everything. So just go to the website, truthseeker.com. And uh, yeah, there's so much free stuff as well. So with that being said, Peace and shalom. Thank you guys for hanging out. Really enjoyed it. 
I love y'all. We're going to do it again very soon. Um, yep. Peace, peace. Shout out. Your will is so much higher than mine. So much higher than mine. Your thoughts so much deeper than mine. So much deeper than mine. Well, that does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.